uh, I know I did. And so, uh, so uh, yeah, as I say, we are going to do the Gen 5, we're going to do the Gen 5 architecture simulator to, uh, this uh, morning. This is going to be one where I would like, if you can, for you to play along with your own laptops. Minimum spec laptop is necessary. All you need is a web browser with an internet connection. And uh, that itself was a struggle for this room. The hotel, the password is hotel900, uh, all one word. And I think there's a space in there. It shouldn't be. And it's the conference Wi-Fi connection. Um, OK, this is a rough schedule. We're not going to run exactly to it, I don't think, because uh, uh, you know, some things take a little bit longer than I, th th than I think. Roughly, we're going to have an introduction where I'm going to talk about what Gem 5 is and what it's for uh, and how you obtain and build it. Then we're going to jump straight into doing kind of a hello world in Gem 5. That's going to introduce you to a very basic simulation in Gem 5, uh, kind of probably the most simple simulation you can do that's actually running a program. Uh, then we're going to jump into the Gem 5 standard library which kind of uh, is a relatively new addition. It's probably about, two, two, or probably about two years old now, but really simplifies how we can set up architecture simulations in the Gen 5 simulator. Uh, and that's going to cover a wide range of topics. That's a big kind of umbrella. We're going to go through the Gen 5 resources. Some point in this, I suspect we'll break for coffee. Uh, I'll just do that whenever that coffee break comes up. Introduces the stats. Introduce you to doing traffic generation in Gen 5, which is another new feature we kind of want to advertise and get people using. Uh, and uh, also introduce you to various parts of the architecture simulator. Uh, since whenever I teach Gen 5 ever at any conference, there's always someone who comes up and says, Gen 5 runs far too slow for me. I need it to go faster, which is understandable. So there's going to be a whole section where I go over speeding things up, how you can make your simulations run faster and the various trade-offs that you can do. Uh, Matt Sinclair will arrive at some point to talk about the GPU model in Gen 5. I'll hand over to him at that point. That's going to be at the end. And then we'll wrap up before the lunch break. Uh, tentative, but we're going to cover a lot of ground in this uh, thing. So first, of all, first task I want people to do who are interested in going along is to set up GitHub code spaces, uh, just to give you just GitHub code spaces is nothing scary. It's essentially a virtual machine run by GitHub that you can interact with via your web browser. Uh, so if you go to this URL here, uh, hit the Gen5 uh, HPCA 2023 slash Gen5 tutorial code spaces. And then all you need to do is go to code and then create code spaces on master. It'll take a minute to load, and then what you should see is what looks like a Visual Studio uh, code environment, but within your web browser. So um, this is going to work. I want to show, go through this myself. OK, yep. Um, on GitHub, you go to this code, code spaces. I've already got one loaded, so I'll just delete it and start again. Yep. Code. Code spaces, come on. Great code space and master, and it should load up something. That looks. It can take a minute because it needs to pull the correct repo information and stuff image found, and it builds a container. So if you know Docker, this essentially builds on top of Docker. You're essentially running, um, essentially, a container is being built and for for you to run your code into. So um, please, uh, if you have any problems, uh, put up your hand. And I've got at least two people here who I can go around to help people out who want to play along with this tutorial. Oh. Oh, it's a hotel nine zero zero. One all lowercase, one word. It's a conference Wi-Fi connection. Sure. Yeah. Oh. No, no. I think I think I did have on the side with a space. No, no space. All one word. Yeah. Good. Like that would 
if there's any part that's going to go wrong, it will have been this. So I'm glad it's all <laughs> like this is uh, I had a little drama this morning when I realized I actually left the repository private and no one could get into it. But I, I was public and we can use it. Great. So anyone who's familiar with Visual Studio Code, that's just what this is. And it's running on a server somewhere in Silicon Valley or something. So you don't, it's not running on your own machine. It's quite handy. Uh, should have everything you need. So go back to the slides. Yep. So, uh, so what's in this code space is just, well, we've com already compiled a version of Jam 5 for you. Uh, so well, there's already a binary in, in here. It can be run just with the Jam 5 command. So uh, we will, I will talk over this in a tiny little bit, but essentially Gem 5, depending on your machine, can take an hour to compile. If you've got a really weedy machine, if you've got a really fast machine, maybe you compile it in like 10 to 15 minutes. So Gem 5 is already compiled for you as this Gem 5 binary. Uh, there's a materials directory, which is going to, going to contain everything that you need for this, for the, for everything we're about to do over the next two or three hours. And just an FYI, because some people ask this, this is a completely free open source repository thing. You're free to pull it, use it, play around with it later on. The only thing we'll disable is the actual code spaces because we might have get charged for that after a while. But the repository with all the materials in it that we're going to use, feel free to download it and use it in your spare time. Uh, if you have the link, uh, do, do with it as you see fit. Okay, while you're all waiting for your code spaces to spin up, I'm going to talk briefly about what Gen 5 actually is and what you can do with it. So what is Gen 5? Well, I really like this definition, if you're going to get like it in like two or three sentences. The Gen 5 architecture simulator provides a platform for evaluating computer systems by modeling the behavior of the underlying hardware. It enables researchers to simulate the performance and behavior of complex computer systems, including the CPU, memory system, and the... Uh, and the interconnects. This makes it possible to study the performance of different microarchitecture and architecture choices, as well as the effects of different workloads without having to build or test the real systems. Uh, and that was chat GPT who said that, which is one of my favorite toys recently. Uh, this, they got it right first time. I just said, what is the Gen 5 architecture simulator? Spat this out. I agree with pretty much everything it says. Um, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty accurate. It's just a simulator. It's just a simulator for simulating computer architecture. I'm going to go over exactly how that works. But first, a little bit of history to give people credit where credit's due. Um, Gen 5, really, we like to say Gen 5 is over 20 years old now uh, because really the first iteration was the Gem simulator, which was established roughly in the year 2000. And that provided a detailed memory model. And roughly two years later, there was the M5 simulator. Um, by the way, it took me a while to figure this out, but M5 is apparently a really nerdy Star Trek reference that I didn't get. Uh, apparently in the old Star Trek series, they find a computer called M5. And that's so whatever. At some point, these two groups found each other and decided that, hey, we're both got uh, competencies in different parts. This part is providing a simulator and this part is providing a detailed memory model. Let's basically make one big tool, and that was Gem5, Gems, M5, Gem5. That was established in 2011. So depending where you measure it, the project is at least uh, 12 years old. Um, I like to say it's five. So pretty, pretty good project, pretty old. And it's a truly public infrastructure project. I can't emphasize enough, we really put a lot of onus on this, like this belongs to anyone who wants to own it, in a sense. Uh, first of all, it's completely open source. It's free, as in like beer, as in you can use it without paying any money towards anyone. You can just download it and use it. And we are completely open for anyone to contribute to it. Uh, I think anyone who's been around computer science long enough, you know, you realize that open source doesn't always mean you can actually submit your patches to it uh, because people are very protective of their code. No, we really welcome patches to be submitted. We get patches all the time. Our last release of Jam 5, which covered about 
six months of development had about 50 unique uh, people contribute to it. Some people contribute one or two patches, some people contribute hundreds. So it really is uh, open for anyone to contribute or improve. That's one of the major strengths of the project. So who uses Gen5 and why? I'd say roughly you can break these down into three categories. Uh, first is education institutions use it. Second is academic researchers or public labs use it. And third is industry uh, for like R&D purposes. Uh, over briefly, the reason we use it in education is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can't really expect uh, students to have access to multi-billion dollar uh, architecture, like factories to build architecture products and test them out. You need to depend on some form of simulation or virtualization of the process. So yeah, uh, you can use Gen5, for example. Simple thing that we get students to do is when they're learning about cache hierarchy setups, you, we can take out Gen5 and go, okay, how does this uh, application perform in a one level cache hierarchy? How, and then like, how does it perform with a two level? And how does it perform if we change the sizes of these caches? And the Gen5 simulator will give time estimates for these, for example. So it can educate and help people understand how different architecture choices can impact performance. Second is research. Uh, I won't go over this uh, graph in complete detail, but essentially systems research is having an idea, designing it, testing it, normally finding out your idea is completely crap and you need to go back and start it again. So you can go round and round this cycle about 50 times and there's obviously a need for there to be a cheap solution to, evolve, to, to like evaluate your, your designs. You can't design a new risk five chip every single time you have a little idea to tweak it. You need to have some sort of simulation. So the gen five is in the kind of that part of the chain when you have a new design. Okay, first step, let's code it up and see what gen five makes of it. Uh, does it actually run the programs we think it's going to run? Does it break anything? And does it actually improve the execution time in any meaningful capacity? So that's where researchers will use it. Um, we have a little bit of data on researchers, as I thought I'd share. We found it's quite interesting and also quite motivating. About 70% of all computer architecture research relies on some kind of simulation. And we found Gen5 was by far the most popular, uh, but of those 70%, only about 20% use Gen5 directly. And rolling your own solution, what I mean is just literally coding your own simulator, remains an incredibly popular uh, way to do things. So our kind of internal goal on this is to get that to above 50% of all, all the simulation research being, being using Gem5 by in the next five years. And we think given the improvements we're adding to the project, we're gonna get there. So if you're wanting to learn Gem5, now is a good time. We're really trying to push this to be used as the de facto architecture simulator. So people ask about industry, uh, I normally say, I don't know to what extent it's used in industry because industrial people are inherently quite secretive. Uh, but we know there are definitely some big players who contribute to the project and are in regular contact with us. Um, Google uh, designed, if you've got a Pixel phone, I believe a lot of the uh, chips and stuff inside the Pixel phone are designed on Gen 5. Kind of know that from our contacts there. I believe, what is it, Jason? Six, intern six teams in Google have used Gen 5. Is that something we're allowed to say? Something like that, ish. ARM use it quite a lot. ARM are very good, very uh, good contributors to the project. Uh, use it for obvious reasons. Uh, and AMD is a strong contributor as well. Uh, the GPU stuff at the, at the end of this uh, presentation is uh, in kind of collaboration with uh, AMD. Uh, but there, I can say certainly there's a lot of others who keep more quiet about it. Uh, I receive emails from all sorts of people asking for help, uh, a lot of them in industry or weird startups. Uh, a lot of RISC-V startups are starting to use Gen5. Um, that's quite a big area as well. So yeah, just a kind of FYI. Uh, another top question I've ever started is, what like, language do we use? Uh, I would say, I always think of Gen5 as being like a, like a C++ wrapped in Python. So the core simulation, uh, models and the core simulator tool is C and C++, well, it's just C++. And uh, then we kind of have a big layer of Python that is mostly user-facing for people to deal with. So when you code up your simulation, your 
architecture designs, you basically code it in Python and then feed that into Gem5 and Gem5 will um, interpret that Python and run your simulation. And we're going to do the two examples on that. Uh, in this tutorial, we're really, we are only going to deal with the Python level. Uh, we have uh, tutorial materials on dealing with the C++ level. Uh, C++ levels, when you really want to get into the nitty gritty, like adding uh, new uh, ISA instructions, for example, you need to modify the C++ or extend it in some capacity. We're going to focus on just building uh, simulations for because we've only got three hours. Uh, in the summer, we're doing a five-day boot camp, so five days is six days, and even then, we can't fit everything there is to know about Gen Five in those five days. So that's why we're keeping it very brief over the next three hours. Nomenclature, I think it's important because you can get very confused if you don't really understand what we're talking about. So we kind of so when I refer to the host, I'm referring to like literally the hardware that Gen Five is running on. So the host is like my laptop, or the host is like a server somewhere. I suppose a host in this case is cold spaces. And then we say that the uh, Gem5 runs on top of the host, and then the uh, Gem5 simulates hardware. And then we have the guest that runs on top of the simulated hardware. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably the extent I'm going to use these terminologies here, but it's pretty easy to understand how, how you can get confused with this when someone says, oh, I'm running simulated code on top of guest, whatever. Uh, and then we have the simulator's performance, which is the uh, wall clock time on the host. And then you've got a simulated performance, which is the performance of what you simulated. Right, a little bit confusing, but yeah, we're, Simulating hardware on top of hardware, so we need to kind of be clarified. Uh, this particular you have to be careful with because the sim like a simulated second is like can be a hundred thousand seconds on the host, so there is a big disparity there. Okay, my intention for this tutorial is. Once I've talked, I don't want to talk ever for more than 10 minutes. So everything we've broken up with something for you to do, and then we'll go back. So I thought in this tutorial, let's hit the ground running with like a hello world example. And even if you don't fully understand what's going on, we're going to go back and talk over how it works and what it does. Uh, this next slide doesn't really affect you guys very much because you're running on code spaces, but I think it's important to include it anyway. The, the typical flow for getting Gen 5 is you get clone the repo, you go into the repo, and then you run this bit, you run a build command. We use a build system called scones, which um, appears to be very uncommon for people to use scones these days, but it's a, it's a build system. You build it, and uh, then it will create your Gen 5 binary, which you then use to run simulations. Uh, for the Git repo has two branches, the stable, which is the default branch, uh, and that will have, its head of that branch will be the latest uh, version of Gen 5, and then the develop branch, so which is just day-to-day -day development. That changes all the time. It might not be fully working correctly. It's just our development branch. And about two to three times a year, we merge the develop branch into the stable branch to make a new release of Gen 5. Uh, so we recommend using stable. We do not stop you using develop because sometimes there's new exciting stuff that you can't wait like three months for. So let's start it. Uh, if you are in your code spaces, there should be, should be a directory called, uh, well, you should be able to find materials and then hello world.py. And I should have already provided you the import statements for this thing we're about to do. Um, so this is importing stuff from Gen 5. We're going to incorporate into our, system, into our simulated system. Some of this should be fairly, like, I think some of this stuff, you should already kind of see where, where we're going with this, like Gen 5 components, memory, import, single channel DDR3-1600, right? Some of the other stuff, I'll, I'll, it will, almost everything else here, I'll explain. Has everyone who wants to play along with this got this far? No problems? Okay. Again, please put up your hand. I have two willing volunteers here who will provide tech support. So this is where we're at. So 
first thing we do when setting up a Jam5 simulation is typically we obtain the components. So I'd like you to code up these three lines here. And just an FYI, if any, if you accidentally fall behind, I've I've provided I've I've provided uh, completed examples inside that same directory, so you can kind of go and see the completed example and copy out what you copy and paste what you need. But I'll try to be slow and allow everyone to go go at their go at go at their own pace. So first line here is we're saying we want to get a cache hierarchy, and this is kind of a cheat. We're saying actually we'd only want a cache hierarchy set up in this system, so no cache. Which essentially we're saying here is. Uh, just kind of connect the processor directly to the memory system, and uh, we don't want any caches in it. A second one is our memory. Uh, so 16 channel DDR3 1600 and one gigabit. Uh, you specify that via a string. And finally, we specify what processor we want. Uh, we have this object called, well, this class called simple processor. All you really need to know about simple processor is it's prob it's a, a, a process a simple processor is a processor that contains multiple cores of the same type. That's what that allows. So here we're saying the type of core we want is an atomic core. I'll go. I'll talk about this a little bit more later in the presentation. But your different types of cores in Jam Five to simulate well slightly different types of cores, but essentially it can affect the fidelity of your simulation. So for instance, the atomic core is relatively simple and won't get you all the simulation information, but it's considerably faster than say the O3 CPU, which tries to simulate out of order models inside the core, which is very computationally intensive and can explode the runtime of Gen 5. We're saying to keep this very straightforward, we're gonna have one, one of those cores on the ISA, we're gonna use ISA x86. Um, just FYI, if you wanted to change this to simulate ARM, I say to ARM. And then we also support, uh, so we support RISC V. Uh, those are the three major ones, x 6 ARM, RISC V. And then we support uh, MIPS still, Power. And I'm definitely missing one, I'm an I, Jason. Yeah, but we support multiple ISA. The design of Gen 5 is specifically ICs are kind of plug in and your rest, your simulation should be relatively, you can keep it relatively the same. So yeah, um, multiple, you can target multiple ICs. And then we add them to our board. So the metaphor here is you have a board that you're plugging your components into. Yes. Uh, yes. And yeah, our metaphor here for uh, this is you have a motherboard that you're plugging your components into in a kind of modular fashion. We're going to use a simple board, which allows you to run a, a SE mode simulation, which I'll explain what that means in a bit. But it requires three components, the processor memory and the cache hierarchy, and also set a clock frequency. So plug all that into your board. And I hope you can see here that this is a modular design. Uh, if we wanted to put in a different memory, we just put in, we just specify a different memory system here. If we want the cache hierarchy, we would specify the cache hierarchy setup here. And this works in, I will say, most cases. Every once in a while, there's a component that doesn't like talking to another component, and that's just you'll get a error of some kind. But we try our best to keep it as modular and open ended as possible. At that, at that point, after we set up the board, we've kind of specified the hardware we're going to run in this system. That's kind of the end of it for this very simple example. Then we need like what we call like a workload, which would, you know, essentially the software you're going to run on Gen 5. Uh, no, sorry, software you're going to run on your simulated system. Um, and we discovered a long time ago that really what people want to run on their simulated systems doesn't actually vary that much. Uh, I would like most researchers are just using the same benchmarks over and over again. And so to kind of stop that constant churn of people uh, basically recompiling gaps and creating a disk image and doing all this stuff, uh, we just kind of provide these 
free of charge from the project and you can obtain them via your Python configuration script. So this line 24 here, what this is doing is saying, hey, get me the x86 uh, hello world binary, right? This is the kind of key to that binary. And what this function does here is it'll literally pull it from our online repository to your local system. Uh, it caches it, so it's not going to pull it every time. It caches it, you only pull it the once. And then we go, hey, board, set the SE work binary workload and set it to this binary here. The two lines, we've already loaded a binary into our system. And then, so we've got our kind of definition of the system we want to simulate. And we've got the, the workload is loaded into the simulation. Sorry, the workload is loaded into the board. And then the board is loaded into the simulator, which kind of manages the simulation. So simulator equals simulator board, set the board. The last one here is simulator.run. At this point in the script, it will run the simulation. When the through. Oh, I thought, oh, I think I did these slides sort of back to front. I'll go back. Um, so let's run it. This command should work in your code spaces. Yes, you have a question? Board. Uh, board is, if you remember, this is board. The, the metaphor here is it's like a motherboard that you're plugging components in. Is that all you wanted? Okay, yeah. Uh, again, if you if I go too fast, there is a completed example for everything I'm working on. So uh, in, 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 in the materials directory, there is a subdirectory called completed or something. And you can probably see. So if you, yes, please don't get too lost if I maybe go through slides too fast. Yeah, we set up, we set up simulator and senior, and you should be able to run your hello world example. So gen five materials, whole world, I don't run. And this should run in like a second. This is incredibly fast. And if you know it's gonna work, if it prints hello world at the bottom here. Uh, uh, is anyone having a disaster with this? Does anyone have or any, any problems of any kind? Is there, or is everyone happy? Oh, yeah. So for me, it runs just on, like it always gives you like a warning, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say yes. For the purposes of it, the, these warnings do have are meaningful. They're not junk, but they are just warnings. And for the purposes of this, the warnings aren't don't impact anything. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably that. Yes, they're not. Yeah, I would say not junk. They do mean something, but for the purposes of doing a hello world example, not a problem. But yeah, but Gen five does. Gen five is noisy for 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 sure. Uh, yeah, we have an like we have a. I think we do have a warning here. Yeah, warning: DRAM device that doesn't match the range assigned. That is a problem in some simulations for sure, but it's not a problem here, so don't don't need to worry too much about it. Yeah, like um, just, yeah, like uh, as I said, all these are meaningful. So like the DRAM device capacity, like we've set it to simulate just one gigabyte of memory, but then. We said use GDR three sixteen hundred, which is actually eight gigabytes. Right. So that means the actual number of banks that we're simulating is not the number of banks in the GDR sixteen hundred plus. So if what you care about is simulating the GDR sixteen hundred correctly, GDR three sixteen hundred, then this simulation might not give you correct results. That so and, you know the other warning there, read link may yield unexpected results in various se settings. So since we're using SE mode here. Um, we're using the host. So it could be that proc self exe on the host might be different than what you're expecting in the gas. Yeah. I was just about to explain kind of um you know well wait what just happened. And we just did a hello world program at one core, at no cache hierarchy, at one gigabit of memory, and we use SC mode. And as you explained, there's kind of two modes in Gen 5. There's SE mode and FS mode. So SE mode is syscall emulation mode. So you'll notice in that example, despite it being incredibly simple, it still outputted something to your host machine's terminal. So syscall emulation mode essentially means that when there's a syscall inside the binary, 
it kind of skips the Gen 5 simulation and goes directly to your host machine, which is quite, which is a way of speeding up your simulations if you don't care about what your syscalls are doing or you want to access resources on your host machine. Um, so that's what we did here. I think the only like major syscall in that binary would be to print the hello to the terminal. I'm semi-confident in that. So that's what we use here. The other one is FS mode. And FMS mode is, you can imagine, like, FMS, FS mode is like, you simulate everything, which means you have to simulate an operating system, right? This binary needs an operating system to function. So if we run this in FS mode, I would have to sit here for two hours to wait for a Linux kernel to boot and then wait for whatever else services or whatever else I needed to boot and then run it. But we'd not be running any of that binary on the host machine. Uh, and we demonstrated some core library APIs here. I really do mean core, like we really have got to the core of what we provide as library. The board, boards have components, you specify the components, load the board, you specify a workload to the board, and then you load, the, then, you, then you put the board in, in the simulator and click run. Um, and yeah, I did this, I don't know why I did this slide here. But yeah, this should be your, what your complete example looks like. Uh, so again, it's pretty straightforward. Once you go to your imports, you obtain your components, you add them to the board, you set your workload, and you set up your simulator and run a simulation. Yeah? So I have a better idea. What are, what's like a good example of workload where you would actually need to edit the best mode and not the same kind of best mode? So for instance, um, if you're going to run like, uh, Parsec benchmark suite, right? Like that needs to run on top of an operating system to run. And so you would have, so the really, we're, we're gonna get into this. There's gonna be an example coming up, but you would need to specify the set workload. Okay, what, what kernel are you loading into your simulation? Okay, give me a disk image. And that disk image would have to have your operating system and the, what was there, Parsec loaded into that. And then you would have to specify, you know, all these different things. Um, to get a full system workload working. It's, it's just a fact of the matter that, I also, like I suppose to kind of also answer your question, SE mode, first of all, we don't have all the syscalls implemented in like SE mode. So sometimes you run things in SE mode and you'll just get an error going, hey, uh, Gem5 doesn't know how to funnel this uh, syscall to the host. That's just on us. We just need to develop that out. Uh, secondly, is you're losing a kind of fidelity in your simulation because you're bypassing like some things that your program's running that might be important. Um, oh, uh, we have OpenMP has worked. Yes, uh, we have. I have an example. No, I don't include it in these slides, but I do have a working example somewhere of running OpenMP in SE mode, for example. So that is, but yeah, so is that what, wait, was that just the extent of your question? Can you run OpenMP? Time ago, I tried simulating the whole version of the other project. Yeah. With the full system, then I need to combine it and start yeah. my turn off to the end of the OpenMP was not allowable. It allows me to say, okay, we don't have all the functionality because there are some still some clock links that we cannot copy. Yeah. And the middle of the simulation was uh, crashing all the time. Yeah. Uh, That's so, yes. Yeah. Uh, that is a pain. I feel your pain. Uh, it's very hard to set up full simulations. That's why we provide resources of pre built things that should kind of work out of the box. Especially painful when you have to like, do a full system simulation, something like MIPS, and you have to compile your kernel and get a disk image with everything in it compiled to this ISA that isn't very widely used or supported, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, but you can run, OpenMP will work in uh, SE mode for sure. I did it like two days ago. <laughs> um, okay, I gave you like this super high level hello world example, but like what's actually going on behind the scenes here? How does this actually work? Um, on a one, say I would say, disappointingly, Jam Five simulations are complex because modern systems are complex, and there's almost no escaping that reality. If we want to simulate a x an x86 uh, system that can boot Linux and run all the major benchmarks and everything else, 
it's 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 like complex just think on even a level or we have to have code for every single isa instruction that is kind of kind of like be possibly run that's complex but taking that back at its core gen 5 is also relatively simple if we're just talking about how the core of the simulator actually works and i feel it's important you should understand this before or to really appreciate what gen 5 is doing and how your simulations are running so at its core it's it's a discrete event simulator. I feel like this is one of those things that you learn in undergraduate studies and thought, who like, why the hell do I ever need to know this? It's so abstract and weird, but this is a use case of using it to simulate things like Gem5. So uh, essentially you have an event queue. An event queue has events. They're essentially just function calls to do certain things inside your simulated environment. Uh, and the event queue starts by popping the earliest scheduled event on your event queue. So this would be a time step 10, for example. And then you just execute that event. Essentially, the beauty of event queues is that event will can schedule events in the future. So it might say, hey, a time set 55, this happens. So the example kind of I try to go with, if you want to relate this to computer architecture, an event might be request value from memory location X. That's an event. But in real world systems, you don't get that value instantaneously. There's a latency, right? So then the event schedule in the future would be in uh, 100 time steps from now, give me that value and then you know it will continue like that and there'll be stuff that happens in while that component or wherever it is is waiting for that memory to be returned to it that memory value to be returned to it and it just continues on like this forever well not forever until the end of the simulation but it continues on like this for a while and then more events are queued so for instance okay we'll do this and we'll add a new event and obviously, you're not always, you can add, like this, you can schedule anywhere on the event queue. Uh, I normally get, the, I normally say there's no stupid questions, but um, I almost always get two stupid questions about this. And I'll just clarify. Someone always asks, can you schedule events in the past? And I think when they say this, they think they're being really clever, but it's not. The answer is no, it will return an error. Another question I seem to get, I've got a few times is, can you schedule an event for the same time step? Yes. And I think, I believe all Gem 5 does is it will pop the, the earliest, the earlier scheduled one first. Those are the two questions I always get. I don't think they're very interesting, but that I think everything functions as you'd expect. That's how Gem 5 works. So I've got an example here of this in action. Uh, this slide is going to fill with a ton of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere. Anywhere in the queue. You can schedule it. You can have an event queue with a thousand events in it, and you can schedule your event to be the next one if you wanted, theoretically. Um, so this is kind of a example how this works using this kind of time scale. So we start at time zero, and then there's time X at the end. And this is so we might start with fetch an instruction, and that would schedule an event in the future that will be, see, that will be sending requests to stat, to the cache. And the time here would be uh, basically the latency value of this event. So latency is a really important Gem 5. You have to, if you're coding Gem 5 kind of from scratch, you have to make decisions such as, um, you know, the latency of certain events, because that impacts when things are scheduled on the event queue. And then when that is reached, you might get a miss L1 sends, sends to D, DRAM. You know, that will be the, the result of that function being called. So we'll schedule uh, something in the future to the DRAM latency because we're request sending it to DRAM. And we'll put a read in Q here. That's schedules in the future to the DRAM latency, the D DRAM read latency. And then we get the data from the, from the DRAM. And then there's a response latency, and then uh, we the cache receives the data, and then there's a series of events here, and the time step is one cycle. 
so even for this relatively common thing, there's like what five steps here. And you got to keep in mind there's multiple things happening at once in Gem Five, so likely realistically the event queue is going to have stuff here, 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 here. It's also processing as well. Oh, and then fetch next instruction. Just in terms of like this is almost nomenclature, and uh, but uh, we need a unit and we call our unit ticks. Uh, so and you can set this. In Gem Five to be to, to find what tick actually is in terms of seconds, but our default is uh, one is that picosecond, uh, ten to the power of twelve ticks per second. Yeah, which is I have certainly found is fine for almost anything you want to simulate. Theoretically, you could get more fine granularity. I think that's probably overkill. Uh, this appears to work. So, anyone have any questions? So that's like the I would say that's like the core like. Nucleus of Gem Five is the event simulator. Like, yeah, and everything else kind of builds on top of this, its own capacity. I could go on about sim objects for a very long time, and I've elected kind of not to, for better or worse. But how do you schedule these events? And the kind of thing I think is in Gem Five, everything is a sim object. And sim objects kind of do two things that are relevant. They either schedule events or process and process events when they talk to other sim objects. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, just uh, clarify. So about talking to sim objects. So one on one is able to see you by the outside. Yes. Yeah. I'll rephrase a little bit. If you wanted to simulate a one gigahertz clock, you would schedule an event every thousand ticks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way I see it, so yeah, everything in Gen 5 is, with very little exception, is a sim object or connections talking to, or, or kind of communications between sim objects. So an example of a sim object in Gen 5 it would be um, our DDR3-1600 would be a sim object, and that is triggered by events in the event queue and then responds to those events by also scheduling other events and then talking to other sim objects. So I really tried to find it before this, but I didn't have time. But we have this output to Gem 5 that kind of makes Gem 5 kind of look like a graph uh, of connected sim objects, which is very cool. So that's essentially what Gem 5 looks like behind the scenes. Up until about two or three years ago, if you wanted to simulate almost anything in Gem 5, you would be connecting sim objects together. And that's hard to scale. Um, because when I say you need to connect sim objects together, it's down to the level of, OK, now I have to put in my MMU cache. OK, and how does the MMU cache connect to the memory bus? OK, and what does this connect to? OK, and how does the my various ports of my core connect to the wider system? OK, I've got a three-level cache hierarchy. How do each of those layers talk to another? Because each layer is a sim object, and each layer has talks, and then, and it schedules an event in the future. So we had this problem in Gen 5 that even for the basic system I got you to code at the beginning, if you were to code that up purely by connecting sim objects together, it would take hundreds of lines because you'd have to specify every tiny little detail of your system. Maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred. Uh, and then for anything of any complexity more than that, hundreds. And what we found out actually in the project is what people were doing was passing around pre-made scripts of connected sim objects. Uh, and Evo was sort of modifying these scripts over and over again and passing them around through like mailing lists and repositories and everything else. So that's why we in Gen 5 came up with the standard library, which is essentially doing the same thing, but at a more official level. So everything in the library is essentially, I mean, you, it's all open source. You can dig into this. Everything in the standard library, everything you've coded thus far is essentially a layer of abstraction for connecting all these sim objects together, which then schedule events in the event queue. So um, yeah, as I said here, the standard library uh, allows you to just quickly create systems with, with pre-built components and other things. Uh, and we've purposely created, created it to be modular so you can swap and replace components of different types in your system. 
and kind of calling back to the example that you did, uh, we kind of have this metaphor in the standard library. Uh, I didn't grow up in America, so I don't know what the store is called here, but the store where you get to go in and build your computer and grab co components and, and put them in a basket and go home and put, solder them, not solder them, obviously, put, put them into your board. That's the metaphor. You have a board. Oh, this board accepts this, this type of processor. Okay. Oh, there's 50 of them. Okay. I'll choose this one. I'm going to put this in the board. Oh, well, now I need memory for my board. Okay. Well, there's like a billion different memory chips that are compatible with this board, I put them in. Same with cache hierarchy. So that's a standard library metaphor. We're building things from the motherboard up. And then as you've already observed, putting in workloads and running it in the simulator. This is kind of how it looks at the level of like a, a class hierarchy. Uh, but just so you know, like in our system, we have things like, you know, an app, uh, what's a good, where's a good part to start on this? Uh, we have like an x86 board for running uh, x86 simulations, and that needs a processor. An example of a processor would be the simple processor. It needs a memory system. And again, I keep going back to the DDR3-1600. I don't know why. There's plenty more. Uh, abstract cache hierarchy. Uh, you know, we've got choices here. We can do a classic cache model, which for, for example, a private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy. We also do something called a Ruby cache hierarchy. That's a slightly uh, slightly different way of doing uh, cache hierarchy simulations in Gen 5, but you can just plug that in and it should work. Uh, so for instance, later on, we're going to do um, a messy two level cache hierarchy uh, system. Um, I already talked about kind of the code for this, so it's all open source, uh, but just so you know, like everything inside the standard library is in, well, Gem5 first, uh, source, Python, and then Gem5. Uh, and everything you import uh, follows this structure. So, uh, for example, uh, Gem5 components boards, simple board is uh, Python Gem5 components boards. Uh, oh, board isn't expanded here. But yes, uh, it would be in there. Uh, Anyone who's worked with Python kind of understands this uh, import style. I'm not a really big fan of how Python does imports, but I've learned to live with it. So uh, this is how that was how you import things, and you can just import things and uh, and then run the simulation from there. Um, yeah. So. Oh, components. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good point. Uh, components are like, I would say, represent in some some capacity uh, hardware in a system. Whereas the resource here, you saw the resources before, as in the binary resources are kind of like. Okay, my definition of resource is something that isn't necessarily an architectural specification, but can be used to run your simulation. So a good example is like a workload, a binary, a test. Uh, and the simulator obviously isn't a piece of hardware that you're simulating. It is the simulator that will run simulation. So it's just a way to, to break those concepts up. Yeah, I would say that's a good enough definition. Uh, yes, yeah, so for example, common resources, uh, kernels, disk images, binaries, tests, benchmarks, checkpoints, uh, which we'll get into later on, uh, for example. Uh, anything that isn't, it's not, work, resources aren't specifications of your simulation, they're define what you're running in your simulation or how your simulation runs. I just go back. Uh, again, I will just re, re go over the example we just did. Don't worry, there's other examples coming up. Uh, so yeah, uh, just you know, now you understand. We're importing everything from the Gen5 standard library. These are our components. They're putting into our board, setting the workload, running it in the simulator. Behind the scenes, all this, behind the scenes automatically, all these sim objects are connected all up in a way that is sound. And then when you click run, the event queue gets populated and then continues on until the end of your simulation. I want to talk a bit here 
uh, about the Gen 5 resources. I guess your question was a little bit quick, but I'll go over it again, because uh, this is something we've also added here. Uh, resource repository for finding sources for artifacts that are known to be compatible with Gen 5. These resources are not necessary for compilation or running Gen 5, but maybe you but may aid users in running simulations, e.g. disk images, kernels, application, cost compilers, etc. Resources are held in our cloud bucket. Uh, the standard library automatically obtains these resources and uses these resources in their simulation. And uh, we are working on a nice web portal for Gen 5 resources so you can browse them and see what's there. I really hate that I have to say this, but for now, they kind of just exist in a JSON file. And <laughs> Uh, you can parse that as you would to find the resources that we support and offer. Uh, working on a website, just not quite there. Yeah. Uh, to look at this, so uh, looking up resources in Gem5, uh, right now, again, you would load up this JSON file, but this is an example here. Uh, risk 5 disk image, uh, and, the and the documentation is a simple risk 5 disk image based on BusyBox. So it just literally had, if anyone knows BusyBox, it's like a, bare, a very small Linux OS uh, that contains norm, just bare essential applications. So it's a very small disk image. Uh, and the and it says the architecture is for RISC-V. Then we've got some stuff that is basically just for machines, uh, i.e. where, where, where like is it? Oh, it's at this URL. Uh, we have some source information. And uh, this links back to where like what the sources for this disk image were and how someone would build it. Uh, additional metadata such as what's the, what's the root partition in this example. This is a very simple disk image. It doesn't have root, it doesn't have root partition. Uh, and then other you know other machine readable stuff like is this a zipped file? Yes. Um, so go back to something you can actually do. I've already coded this up for you, but you can try it yourself. I have not tried to run this before the uh, tutorial. Probably should have, but I think this should work. So all we're doing here is import the obtain resource function. Then this, so you can just open this up. This is already written for you uh, in, in, in the directory. It's just obtain resources.py, three lines, and you can run it with this, gem5 materials obtain resources. Can someone please tell me this works? Oh, good, great. <laughs> I was kind of worried. It's like the one script I didn't test before going into this because it seems so simple and how do you see it in front of me made me realize there might be things that go wrong. So you'll get output something like this. Key line here is the resources available at blah. So Gem5 has downloaded that resource from our repository, cached it locally. And if you're kind of eagle-eyed, you'll see the top line. The first time you run it, it'll go, hey, this, this wasn't found locally. I'm just going to download it. And it finished downloading it. In this case, it decompresses it because it was zipped. Um, if you run it a second time, it won't have these first uh, four lines. It'll just be, oh, we've already got a local cache of this. Cool, I'll just use a local cache. So it's kind of nice. It um, does the legwork for you. It does the, all the clever bits for you. So really trying to expand this out in, 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 into the community. Normally, there's a, quite a valid question that comes that's raised at this point, which is, uh, and, can you use your own resources, like locally things you've created? Yes, absolutely. I will not, th this isn't something, this is just a FYI. I don't expect you to code this up or do anything. Uh, but if you have a binary on your local machine you want to use as a resource, there's custom resource uh, classes, which essentially is taken in the base level case, they'll take in like a path and then you wrap that and plug that into your server. And you're in the example we did, for example, the hello world. And so having the obtain resource, you would have custom resource, blah, and you'd load that and you would uh, do set binary and then set it to that. So yes, you can absolutely use your own custom things uh, locally. There's always gonna be a use case for that. We're just providing commonly used things. Um, another very important part of Gen5, which um, given in your example, you in if you go to Gen5, M5 out, it'll provide all the data, the Gen5 output for your Hello World simulation. Uh, depending on, you might have some of these files, you might have all of them, um, but the one you probably really care about is the stats.txt. 
uh, stat, stats.txt contains the, all the statistics for that Gen 5 simulation. So when you're really simulating anything of any real, if you're really trying to simulate almost anything in Gen 5, you're going to want stats. So an example of a stat would be, uh, well, sorry, basic stat is how many seconds did we, did we simulate? The answer is, in this case, it was Hello World, so almost nothing. Uh, and various other sorts of information that as you can, if you go into Gen 5, M5 out stats, you can scroll through and see probably a large number of stats, even for this basic simulation. Um, the other files, almost everything that begins with the word config is just a different output representation of what you are simulating. Uh, I don't think it'll do it in this case, but the config dot 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 PDF is like a graphical representation of your configuration as, as like a graph. Uh, that I find is mostly hand that's mostly handy in this case for like debugging. It's kind of seeing, okay, how what is Gen5 actually simulated? Okay, I'll look into the config file, config.json, for example. The stats file is uh, really where it contains all the output stats. So you would do a run of Gen5, okay, M5 out stats, get all the stats you need for whatever experiment you're trying to run. For instance, cache misses, for example, is a stat that would be there if we, if we had a stat. Um, if you're doing a full system, sim, full system, sim, full system simulation, uh, we have Gem5 set up that any terminal output is put output in this file. So there'll be a file that it might just be like terminal one. You click on that, you, you can see the terminal output that was for that full system simulation. Okay, let's get back to some hands on example. Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Do you know the answer to that? So it will tell you a lot of information. It'll tell you the number of instructions. It'll tell you the number of factors. It'll tell you the number of memory instructions. Uh, the late, potentially the latency of memory instructions, depending on what the uh, memory system and CP model is. Um, and all those kinds of things. And so from that, you could probably infer yeah. how much overlap there is. But I sure did like a specific case that just the amount of overlap. Um, if you're looking for something super specific like that, often you have to go in and modify the model to add that statistic yourself. Okay. Um Okay, we'll get back on something that's a bit more hands-on for you guys to play with. Um, again, I'm just trying to really like reiterate Gen5 is modular, so you can kind of take designs like a whole world and not modify them that much to get something similar. So the original one I had in this tutorial when I first gave it, I first gave this tutorial last year. And what we had was swap your cache hierarchy for uh, private L1, private L2 and then swap your CPU cores. But I think you're smart enough to probably know how that works. You change the two lines there, references. So one thing I want to show that is maybe a bit outside of the, a uh, bit more exotic and maybe useful for some people's research is let's try to make a traffic generator board. Um, so this was made by someone at UC Davis, the traffic generator code. Um, but the traffic generator is essentially I'm putting this in very barbaric terms, but it bombards your memory system with data so you can basically get stats, stats about how well it's, it performs when it's uh, getting uh, certain, getting hailed with data requests and data accesses and things like this. I don't know why I include this slide, it's very basic. Generator generates data for the memory system. So the metaphor here is, uh, Traffic generator looks an awful lot like a normal board in Gen 5, except the processor is swapped out with what we call a generator. It's just spurning out, it's, it's spurning out data for your, for, for your memory system to deal with. And afterwards, you check your stats outputs to see 
Mm, for example, like uh, what the bandwidth was, what throughput was. If the cache hierarchy in that in that system, you would say, well, how many hits and misses did I take when we were generating all this data to bombard the memory system with? That's essentially what we're trying to do. So then, kind of go back to like the metaphor here. It's essentially our, we have this model called test board. It accepts a very similar parameters to what the simple board did. Uh, except it's a processor as a generator. And in this case, the uh, cache hierarchy is actually an optional. You don't have to put in a cache hierarchy at all. Um, so yeah, essentially that would that's kind of our model. It's fairly straightforward. Board, I want to test this memory, plug. I want to have I want to use this traffic generator that generates this sort of data, plug, run. Normally doesn't take very long. Uh, and then you output some data. Oh, and Gen5 does the rest for you, which is nice. So we go to materials traffic generator. Uh, here I provided some imports and some boilerplate code. And there should be a, I believe there's a comment that says like your code goes here. So I provided all the stuff that I don't think is super important. At the top, you got mostly your imports that uh, I think you'll understand how you would import something in Gen5. At the bottom, there's a simulator boilerplate. I made a comment there that we are trying to get rid of that boilerplate code, but it's there, uh, which will uh, basically initialize your simulation and then start running the generator. So as before, what we do is we set, we, we set up our components. Uh, so this first line here should be very, 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 uh, you know, you should understand this, you're setting up your memory system. And you're gonna set the bottom one, you set up your cache hierarchy. Uh, middle, middle guy here, this is just our generator. We're gonna use the random generator. Uh, these parameters here specify the properties, properties of the generator. You have to specify the max address, which handily we can just do memory to get size for that. Number of cores, let's keep it simple, one core. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, how long the traffic generator should run for, this value of seconds, and the rate at which the random generator is creating the traffic. So 40 gigabytes per second. You could have multiple traffic generator. It's, I believe it's more like just multiple generators. So it's for, if you have a, Jason, could you, what's the use case for multiple generators? So a, a traffic generator is kind of a replacement for a board. Mm. Right? So if you want to simulate multiple independent sources of traffic into yeah. a network or into a system, you have multiple traffic generators. Okay, so it's just a number of traffic generators. Yeah. yeah. Like you're, yeah, I think, Jason's point is a good one. Like, this is simulating in a simulating a core, right? Except we're not actually running an application of any kind. It's just bombarding it with data, uh, because yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. Uh, yeah. So, uh, instead of a or uh, It'll, it'll accept unless there's a bug somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it depends on your memory model and thing. Um, yeah, it's, it completely depends on the model that it's sending traffic to. Most of Gen 5's models have, will model back pressure. And so if the memory can't accept it, it sends a map. That's interesting, I can't accept this right now. So, you know, GDO 3600 was set at a uh, bandwidth of like uh, 12 gigabytes per second. So in this case, it should be rejecting a lot of requests because the rate of 40 gigabytes per second is higher than the bandwidth that a single channel can do especially if random. Um, yeah, so you'll, it, you, you'll see the number of rejected instructions. And then the generators, it's not shown here, but there are options on the generators to either be elastic and whenever it gets that lag to slow down. So it'll only generate requests at whatever the other five will accept. 
or to be inelastic and then continue bombarding it and drop back up to it. Yeah, sorry. I think I realized when Jason explained the answer to that question, I didn't understand it initially. No, I do. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and then we just add them to the board again. I'm really trying to get you used to this pattern, right? I know it sounds like I'm saying the thing over and over again, but that is intentional. The difference here is using the test board, which is specifically set up basically for traffic generators and stuff that isn't really a quote real system. So what we're saying here is here's clock frequency, generator memory, cast hierarchy again. And please feel free to jump in for questions. But I think actually, amazingly, I think I'm ahead of time. <laughs> so um, Yeah. That's a good question. So in um uh in this in the way that we've set up the standard library with boards, cache hierarchies, memories, and processors, the on-chip network is part of the cache hierarchy. Um, you can argue whether that makes sense or not, but um, it's part of the cache hierarchy. So in this case, since there's no cache, no cache, um, the on-chip network is one plus one. Like if you look at the implementation of no cache, it just says plus one. Yeah. And that's it. Um, but we have other kinds of cache hierarchies that have much more complex on-chip networks. Yeah. No, so um, in the standard library, so so you would make your um, new on-chip network, uh, well, if you need to make some modifications to something like Garnet or the Ruby simple network or something, you make those modifications. And then the uh, standard library, you would take those models that you created and show how they hook together. And then, um, set the parameters of those models in the standard model. Yeah, so you don't have to extend the standard model to take advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that be, yeah, I think I should have reset that to start with. We decided early on that for the case of the standard library, our definition of cache hierarchy is almost anything that exists between the processor and memory. Uh, because otherwise we kind of got into all these weird corner cases where we're like, oh, we got to have a parameter for like this and a parameter for that. And it's like, okay, let's encapsulate it all into something we call a cache hierarchy. Uh, so it's not, cache hierarchies can contain a bit more. Cache hierarchy is anything between memory and the processor, or in this case, a generator. Oh, yeah, sure. How much can I tune the cache from? Like, can I specify the number of the HR, the right buffer? So the uh, the basic answer to that question is it's infinitely tunable depending on how much engineering effort you want to put in because you can always. But uh, so you can totally create your own cache hierarchy as crazy and as custom as you want in Gem Five. Uh, you might have to even code some new stim objects and connect things up uh, differently. At the level of standard library, we have provided some off-the-shelf ones. Uh, as an example, uh, private L1, private L2 cache. And from there, we expose parameters just like the sizes of those caches. And I think some, some, some other parameters. But we don't necessarily claim to expose everything that's tunable. But you can, yeah, in Gem, like, yeah. You can, you can simply anything you want in Gem 5. It's always just a matter of engineering effort. Uh, so yeah, depends how custom you want to get. Question goes to this: I'm generally used to like modify the devices, not by specifying the charge, like the right buffer, stack, latency, the context. So, this so where? Yeah. This is not available directly here, so I should need to still modify the it. Really, the you um, it really depends what you're trying to modify. Uh, we we provide what we think are sensible parameters to tune. Uh, for instance, a cache hierarchy to. Uh, 
if you want to do something very custom, you might have to create your own component, which would, you know, as a hacky way to do it, would be to copy and paste something that is almost there and hack it together and create this new component, um, which is seems to be what you're kind of used to doing. Uh, but we're trying to definitely expose more stuff via a common API because you know there's very there's various reasons you don't want people just scrolling through Python code and modifying random values here and there. So yeah, a slightly different answer is that like the idea of standard libraries to be extensible, not parameterized. We explicitly are not exposing thousands of different parameters because. My experience of using Jimpy for the past almost 15 years now is that when you try to modify parameters, you inevitably end up screwing them up. Forgetting to change one of the parameters or changing it one time, not changing it another time, and then you get results you don't understand. And so we're trying to encourage people to use object oriented design and extend things like create your own cache hierarchy, which is an extension of our cache hierarchies. That is customized to what you need it to be. But then it's not saying, you know, minus minus num MSHR is equal 12. It's I created an L1 cache, I know my L1 cache has 12 MSHR. Uh, the more explicit and less implicit uh, setting up. Yeah. So, yeah, you can definitely do that. You would have to create your own cache hierarchy in order to set those things. But that should be. Pretty Our philosophy with the standard library has always been we want to do 95% of the work for you. Uh, because if you're just studying cache hierarchies, you shouldn't have to worry too much about your memory system. You maybe don't have to worry too much about the processor, depending on what you're doing. And if you can just extend something or create your own component just for the part you're interested in and it cooks into our APIs, then we've already saved you a considerable amount of time. That's another big benefit of this general library is like if you want to modify your cache hierarchy or, or, or something like that, you change the cache, you create a new cache hierarchy. And then if you create that new cache hierarchy, it will work with any memory and it will work with any processor or even these generators. It'll work on any board as long as you follow the API definitions. Um, and so, unlike you know, devices down the line, which only works with that ARM starter FS on the Wi Fi. So, this is a way to try to, by not exposing all the parameters, it also makes it a lot easier for us as developers to guarantee that things will work. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a, that was a good discussion to have because it gets more fundamentally in what we're trying to do here. Uh, and I think me and Jason have regular semi-heated debates about what should be exposed and what shouldn't be exposed. Um, so uh, you can run the traffic generator, uh, gem5, and then the traffic generator code. Uh, it should be very fast. Uh, we're simulating a very small amount of time. Uh, we've generated a traffic to evaluate a memory component. This, this, you'll notice this doesn't require a workload or even a real processor. So that's an advantage of this. And users are typically after this consult the stats.py file to get this information, whatever information they care about the memory, they would get it from this. Nice thing about this, just like this is kind of how we want people to use this, is you would write a script like you just written to traffic. And as you might say, uh, you might create your own Gen5 component, but that's you should be able to put in your research paper on gem5 22.1 i wrote this script and my component is this and this is the data i got so it's completely reproducible you're not just passing around masses of scripts it's built on a very understandable and extensible api i'm about to move on a little bit to a slightly tangential example does anyone have any questions about this section we've just done so if you want to see where the uh, SFS that uh, generator sort of uh, produced data, like where looks like. I'd, it, What's the name of the generator? I think it's, it's called generator. Yeah, gen, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, that's the question. I was going to say, navigating the stats, we're trying to improve this. Uh, navigating the stats file is a 
control F adventure uh, because it's just text. Uh, yeah, but uh, the name of the name of the the component will always be translated to the stats. So if you have a something called generator, it'll be there. Um, okay, what I want to do is kind of oh sorry. Before you move on, since as you said, we're a little bit ahead, yeah. and it's been like an hour of you talking. Yeah. Go ahead and take a breath. Uh, see if there's any general questions. Or well, to take a I think I'll take a breath in two more slides, which is a nice time so, point. Because I just wanted to actually get challenge you ever so slightly, <laughs> right? I'm sick of talking about DDR3 1600, right? Let's add a fun memory system to this traffic generator, something that is actually semi-interesting. So in the latest version of Gen 5, we have a HBM2 stack. That's how you would import it. Uh, that means a second generation high bandwidth memory stack. Uh, and basically I want to challenge you is rewrite your traffic generator to generate traffic for this, for, for like this, this like component. I think it should be relatively easy to do. I won't show you the exact code, but if you get stuck, I do have a completed example of this. So I think the purpose of this is to show how easy it would be to modify this code to evaluate something slightly different. Or in this case, a quite substantially different memory system. Uh, and after you've done with that, let's take a break for, well, let's just have a break. I'm going to see if I can find some coffee somewhere. And if you want to have discussion or anything, um, Feel free to come up and discuss. Open to discuss your own research and how it relates to Gen 5 as well. Yeah, so, yeah, we have a coffee break kind of way. Um, I realize it's hard to, um, yeah, I've been talking for 80 minutes. So I realize it's hard to listen to my voice for too long. You, you can talk to us, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't. I'll admit I've never. I've, I wasn't in. I would. I didn't develop the traffic generator. I've not used it, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, I would wait for Jason to think he's more of an expert on it than I am. Um, yeah. Is that? Is it, have you seen my name written down somewhere? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Are you on our mailing list or something, or how do you know? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. That's. It's nice to be recognized. That's flattering. So, yeah. no. I don't want to say no. But that that isn't that is not the way I would describe it. Okay. How I would do it. Uh, that's like a general, like generally. Uh, 
I'm going to guess them. Oh, you have me a black coffee, one sugar. Thank you. Yeah, we're trying, we are getting rid of that. Yeah, because the thing is, like, no, I think that it's a very strange thing to go to like a lower energy level. I don't know if I already did the credit, but it's a minor credit that we're going to buy from the store. The people who are going to be able to buy it from the store are going to be able to buy it from the store. And this is like what we want. So it's like the market is inside. No, the issue was that the catches they were like, and for me, it's just the answer that it's like the army won't get it from the market. It's like the only thing that can be from the market. So, so again, that's why we want to use a standard library because it's standard and somewhat accurate. And those kind of mistakes shouldn't happen. Yeah, there are just contributors. Yeah, so, so if you come here and add. So, if you want to add a new tab here, which um, actually, if so, I want to do that, um, so you could add a new tab directly. So, there's quite a lot of tabs here. All it has is the size. Okay. I asked for one sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All it does is Thank you. Yeah. That's great. So you're Matt. Are you are you still okay for the to be to hand over to GP stuff at some point? Does it work in the code space? Okay. 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 Um. Yeah, I'll just leave you to it. Okay. Yeah, so uh, again, for SE and FS.py, yeah. I completely wipe my hands clean of those files. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not with it. It's not a library. Okay, with the standard library, we should fix that. And so we can have one. Yeah, we can have some of those. That was definitely something yeah. that. Yeah, I don't remember seeing any change that in the talk. I will ask this in the So that would be great. I don't know where the is. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
it felt easier to start on this goal. Yeah. I've never seen that book before. Uh, uh, have you just tried? Is that consistent? Have you tried closing it and then reloading it again? Yeah, normally when I just like click around here, it magically types whatever I can. Okay. Which is not actually yeah. that. What, 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 what web browser are you using? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can use Chrome if I need to use Chrome. All I can say is mine appears to work fine. No one's here complained about problem. Uh, All right, do you want to like give two minute warning? I guess because yeah. we've got a coffee break actually in half an hour, 30 minutes or something. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but I'm 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 a big fan of lots of breaks. So are you gonna talk about simulator and the generators? Yes. Uh if if you yes. All right. Um, I think I'll just make the choice to start. And I'm not sure who's coming back and who's who's whatever. But um, yeah, we can continue going. Next part, I'm going to want to talk about. It's going to be framed as in we're going to do a full system OS boot. Uh, some simulation, but through that, I'll introduce concepts such as the Gen 5 simulator, Gen 5 uh, simulation loop, uh, and various other little things that I think can really improve your Gen 5 simulations and hopefully they'll help you understand how to use Gen 5 a little bit better. So I call this um, a more complex designs, an x86 full system simulation in the standard library. Um, I believe if you go to materials, x86 full system.py, uh, you should see basically the following. Again, just to save typing time, I've given you all the imports we're going to use in this example. Um, so yeah, as you see, it's quite a bit, but uh, mostly components and some other helper things. First line, 
I'd like to get it to right. And as always, there is a completed example of this if I'm going too fast or you lose track or anything. I'm going to go through this thing. Uh, I find the requires function can be really useful in your Gen 5, sim, Gen 5, sim, uh, Gen 5 simulations. It just specifies, because you can compile Gen 5 in different, so I should just maybe said this at the start. You can compile Gen 5 in different ways to include different ISA targets and different cache coherence protocols and Doing this requires the top essentially inspects the binary and makes sure that you've got these got these installed. So we're saying, hey, for this script, we actually require the ISA x86, and we require this cache coherence protocol to be compiled into the binary. Saves saves a surprising a lot of time when you're running a script that kind because of, you don't have this. Gen five kind of catastrophically crashes in a really like you know uh, what like kind of way. Uh, and if you have this and you've accidentally run the wrong binary or compiled it slightly incorrectly, this can really help. So yeah, just a little helper function, not necessary, but helpful. All right, next thing I'm gonna do is um, do a more complex cache hierarchy model. A uh, guy there was talking about what's kind of, because up until now we've only had no cache, right? So let's actually put in a proper cache hierarchy setup here. This is a two level, two level cache hierarchy to the messy two level cache hierarchy protocol. Uh, so, and the various parameters here are uh, the L1, uh, L1 data cache size, the L1 I cache size, L2 size, and the associativity of these caches, uh, and the number of L2 bounds. So, this is a particular cache already set up and it's parameterizable to an extent. Yes? Uh, sir, when you say requires, like, is that required of the binary required of each of five all this parameters? Required of the binary that's running. So it's called, it's like a help, yeah. So it's the gem five binary. Oh, okay. Wait, what did I say? You just said the binary, which could have been- Oh yeah, sorry, unhelpful, yes. Required of the gem five compilation that you're running this for. Because okay. there's, you can, you, you can, for example, run, you can, for example, compile a gem five binary that only contains the ARM ISA. And if you try to run it on your script that requires x86, it will, just crash, hold, spurt out some un unhelpful error when it reaches that part of the simulation. Um, so this is just helpful. Yeah, I don't, I don't like this part of Gen Five, but yes, uh, we're working around that. We're we're wanting to have multiple compilations. We want to have create one Gen Five binary that contains all the coherence protocols. For now, you specify that when you compile Gen Five. So. Uh, yeah, this is just the uh, messy two level cache hierarchy. You can, I mean, feel free to toggle these parameters as you want, but this is a fairly sensible values for these. Uh, and the memory, we're keeping it simple, uh, but you can put in anything you want here. Uh, this, I just want to show like, you know, we've not had a cache hierarchy in our simulation thus far. Here's one. It's actually relatively complex behind the scenes, uh, but you can just do it by specifying the base level parameters. Next slide is pretty cool, uh, but it's probably gonna make more sense when I start to talk about the, 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 the like simulation loop. So, uh, um, so we're gonna have a different type of processor in this one. So remember before we had a simple processor and the definition of simple processor was, um, processor containing n number of cores all the same type. Well, there's a simple switchable processor, which is a processor that can have cores that are swapped out for other cores. Why is that useful? Well, it's useful for basically one reason, uh, making, your, making your simulation run faster. So in this example here, we want to start with timing cores, which are not the highest fidelity cores, they're okay. And at some point we're gonna to switch to the O3 cores, the out of order cores, for the part of the simulation we really want to run to high fidelity with a core that is reasonably approximate of a real world design. And I'm gonna show you how we switch during our simulation, but this is what we're specifying here. We need a special core where you can swap out the cores halfway through your simulation to something else. FYI, you can switch back, switch back and forth. You can like switch to timing, switch to O3, switch back to timing, switch back to O3. And this is something, yeah. Uh, 
Two yeah, yeah, two, two, two timings swapping with two or threes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's still kind of the same definition of num cores as swapped out. Again, I, the only reason I'm doing two cores here is because we've already seen a one core simulation. Just want to show that just by increasing this number, you can increase the number of cores in your system. And again, we're specifying our ISA here, ISA x86. What's the Oh yeah, the, the, it's coming up. Yeah, that, that, that's why I say this might look confusing until a couple of slides when we actually do the switching. Uh, but yeah, essentially less detailed, switch to more detailed, and then we can switch back to less detailed if you wanted to. Uh, really good running example here. If you're doing a full system simulation, let's say you're running an application in full system simulation, you do not give a damn about the OS boot, right? Like that's just to get you to the point in the simulation where you can run your application. That's a good example where you want to run something in low fidelity. You have a question? Is there any other application? Um, I always think of it as some way to speed up your simulation. But I mean, when you do what at some point in this example we're going to like stop the simulation at a certain point and at that point you can almost change anything you want so like the only the only conditions are you i believe the only two conditions is you can't lower your core count because your simulation is already and you can't lower your memory size you can increase it you just can't lower it um but yeah, um, I can't think of any other use case besides this, but I mean, I don't claim to know all the necessary use case people are using Gen 5 for. Do you have something in mind? Uh, I, su I suppose if you wanted to do that, that would be a cheap way to do it, but I suspect if you wanted, yeah, you, you, could, you could do that, uh, but you might just want to write components which are which function in that way without actually having to do it outside of the simulation loop. Do you have a question or? Yeah, it's kind of for the same like 10.5 analog, just not running any simulation. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the, the timing simple is still executing instructions for sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one thing I haven't included here because you can't do you can't do it in code spaces, which is really annoying, is we have a KVM core which is kernel virtual machine, which um, I won't explain it in extreme detail, but essentially you're using your host machine's processor to run the simulation, which doesn't simulate anything. You're just running, you're funneling the instructions through to your host machine. Uh, there, there's restrictions on that. You need specific machine. You can obviously only run the ISA that your host machine is running. Uh, currently only works in x86 and a bit in ARM. Uh, so that's really nice. You can fast forward through anything you want. Uh, when you use in a KVM core. Uh, again, I won't, this should be for the standard setup for you guys. The only difference here is we're using x86 board. The x86 board is specialized to do full system x86 simulations. Uh, but yes, plug in your processor, memory, cache hierarchy, just as before, and clock frequency. The three gigahertz is arbitrary. You can, you can do whatever you want, uh, but yeah. Um, do you want to know, uh, I'll give you a few seconds just to make sure you type in and anyone can catch up and catch up. Um, interesting questions thus far. I think you can kind of almost see where this is going. Uh, How did you validate the... uh, well, that's a dirty secret. We, we, we haven't, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a good point. It's a, uh, this has been a long-standing criticism of Gen 5 is that people code something up in Gen 5 and think it is, you know, we, we, we don't claim this is like running a Dell Optiplex 16, whatever. Like this isn't like, we haven't collaborated this to any real world hardware. This is just as, this is just a way of running an x86 system. We are working on what we, we call no, what we call known good configurations. No good configurations are when we get we get poor master students in our lab to sit down with the board and uh, basically try to tune the Gen 5 simulation to match what the board is actually doing, which is a long but 
it was a long process. We have one board in our system now, which is the uh, Risk Five Unmatched board, which we're still kind of tuning, but it's a good approximation of the Risk Five Matched board. Sorry, we call it the Risk Five Matched board, and it's called the Risk Five Unmatched board. And it's real world. It's real world. Real world equivalent. So short answer is no. We don't have any guarantees that this is like any real world system. We are working on known good systems, meaning we have sat down and actually verified that they are uh, equivalent. Next, I'm going to use this is setting your workload in a slightly different way, and this is a relatively new feature. So with this one line, you type in. Uh, x86 Ubuntu ACM4 boot. I'm going to explain a little bit more in the next slide about exactly what's going on behind the scenes here, but this is going to get you every resource that you need to do an x86 Ubuntu ACM4 boot. In Gen5 resources, the JSON file we talked about earlier. If type workload x86 Ubuntu 18.04 boot documentation, a full boot of Ubuntu 18.04 with Linux 5.4.49 for x86. It runs an exit command when the boot is completed. That means exit the simulation. Uh, unless the user specifies, specifies a read file, in which case the read file is executed. Right? And all this does here is specify how to run this workload. It says set the kernel to this kernel, set it and 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 set and, and set the disk image to this disk image. So that's all it's doing is it's specifying these parameters. And when that line is hit in the configuration, it will automatically download that kernel, automatically download that disk image. So you can look through. This is a way to make things kind of a bit more standardized and portable and a little bit less annoying. So one issue we not really an issue, but one of the annoying things about uh, before we had this workload concept is you would always have to specify what kernel you're using and what disk image. And really, there's no reason for that to be as flexible as it is. You should be able to say, hey, give me the whole package. Give me an x86 uh, Ubuntu 18.04 boot. So it's boot, sim boot, 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 boot simulation, and you figure out behind the scenes what components you need, what resources you need to make that happen. So that's what that's doing here. But we want to change, we want to expand this workload slightly in this example. Because remember this little line at the end? If specified, the read file will be executed after boot. So once you've completely booted the OS, it'll check, hey, is there something specified in this read file? And if there is, it'll execute it. Otherwise, it'll just exit. So let's expand this slightly and have a command that is run when the OS boots. This should become more clear in your own much like before, but we have this command here. This instruction here, M5 exit, will exit the simulation loop. Then we will re-enter the simulation loop, and the simulation will start here. It will run a print statement saying, this is running timing CPU cores. Actually, that's incorrect. It should, it should say all three CPU cores. You can update that on your end. It'll sleep for one second, and then it'll exit again. And we set that on the workload with this parameter. So we set, hey, we, we want this workload, but we want to set the read file contents to this command. Any kind of questions about workloads? I think it will become clearer when we start. Let's see, is it next slide? Yeah, next couple of slides, next like four slides, I think it should be clearer because it explains the event loop in a bit more detail. I'm not sure if we really understand your question, but would it help it says that M5 is a special command that will that the sim the simulator understands to exit the simulation loop. Yeah, like yeah. example, like this is is this not a standard that you want to buy? No, no, uh, no, no, it's not. It's a special gem five binary, okay. which is loaded into the uh, disk image. But when executed, kind of 
goes, it's something the uh, simulator understands to exit the simulation loop at that point. So in this battery, we had a product that it is from the block and then it would be another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you do board.setWorkload and set your workload. And yeah, and they, hopefully this should become clearer in the next few slides when I explain the, simulates, the simulation loop. Oh, that note there shouldn't be there. I think that's a hangover from a previous slide. Um, so uh, I want you to get the idea that in Gen 5 of these things called exit events, right? Exit events, exit the simulation loop and return you back to the Python. There's two in this command. M5 exit. This is, that's, this is the most vanilla exit event you can have. This is what we call an exit exit event. Uh, essentially, when this command is executed inside the simulation, simulation loop will exit. But point of mind, you can do stuff and re-enter, and you will re-enter the simulation immediately after this is executed. So this script will continue from here on. OK, don't worry. Let's go my slide. Explain this. So you run simulate.run, you enter your simulation. And this can go on for hours, weeks, milliseconds, any amount of time. At some point, you should hit an exit event. This exit event can even be the maximum amount of ticks. It could be a control C, anything. At some point, you'll exit your simulation via an exit event. Then you come back to the Python side, i.e. what you're coding right now. Now I just put X here, because it really is just like X. It's a variable. You can do anything you want here. You can mm, almost anything you want. But good examples are changing your configuration in some capacity. Uh, so what we're going to show in a little while is X event processor.switch, which will switch our cores out. And you can do whatever you want. Thousands of line of Python, one line of Python, anything. But the moment you hit sim, the moment you do simulate it run again, you're jumping back into simulation exactly where you're at left off, and I'll continue to exit event. And at some point, you reach an exit event where you pretty much where there's nothing to go back to. There's no Python. There's nothing after last run. This is your last run. There's nothing else to go. Exit. You finish running Gen five. Does everyone kind of understand what that is and why it's Powerful. Yeah. So, like, yeah. 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 It's end of Python script because it's exit the ex like the core simulator is stopped at this point, and then your Python script is just ended, and now it's end of program. Yeah. Uh, No, no, it's just finished. the program is finished. Um, so if you don't specify an exit event in your code, we do have a max tick exit event, which uh, by default is set to something huge. Uh, but there's always essentially an exit event somewhere. So. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do two things during the break. During the break, or at some point, code up these like th four lines, and we'll come back to this when we get back, and try to understand exactly. Just make sure you understand exactly what's happening here, and um, yeah, we can we can return back to discuss this because uh, there's a way to actually make this slightly better that we're going to get to in a bit. Yeah, feel free to take um, your break, which I believe finishes at half twenty. And uh, I'll I'll be around if you want to ask questions. So here we run it runs that first M five X event exits. We switch we switch the processors cores out because we got the special switchable processor, and then we continue the simulation. And you can write if 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 you want, uh, you can write uh, configuration scripts like this that go on endlessly. You have something for every single event exit event you have. It could be like 20 of them and just continue to go through changing them back and forth. I got to talk about a slightly more um, 
concise way to do this that we have put in that involves using Python generators. Uh, it's not as hard as it sounds or even looks. Um, essentially, we can do better. Um, and the key thing to keep in mind here is we've only discussed here the exit exit event. That is the one you get when you M5 exit. But you can put in other exit events inside your code or inside your scripts that do the callback to do different things. So uh, here is a, uh, I don't think this list is fully complete, but for example, you can put in, uh, well, here's a, here's a basic one. The user interrupt exit event is what you get if, if you control C, right? So that's also going to exit the exit event loop, and you can handle that if you want to. Um, you can also do you can also put in your code, for instance, a uh, fail exit event. So you can say, uh, if I reach this point in the program, something has went horribly wrong, so just fail, and you can handle that. Uh, you can put in a checkpoint exit event, saying, "Hey, at this point in my code, I want to take a checkpoint." Uh, we could have, if, if I made this example a bit more clever, we could have put in a switch CPU exit event, which said, hey, at this point, we want to switch our, switch our CPU. So you can move different points. The important thing to keep in mind, these are essentially just tags. They don't have any uh, functional meaning, really. They're just for you to keep track of the different sort of exit events you'd want to maybe handle in your program. So we have this. So you might imagine that you have, say, uh, a work. So a good example are the work are the uh, are the like work begin and work end exit events, which we typically advise people to use if they have a region of interest in their code, a region of interest meaning a part where you want to run in a kind of high fidelity and really get your stats for, and the rest you don't care about. You at the beginning of your region of interest, you would have a work begin exit event. At the end, you'd have a work end exit event, and you would specify when you hit the work begin exit event, uh, let's say wipe like wipe your stats because we're starting from scratch, switch the detailed model, run again, and then when we, re when we reach work end, just dump the stats there. We don't want any more stats. Just dump whatever stats you, you have created in that region of interest. Um, so we have a kind of... Uh, a mechanism for handling these exit events, and it looks like this. Um, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to code this up, whether this is beyond what you want to do, but I think it works really cleverly. You map exit event types to Python generators, right? So here we're saying we've got an exit, an exit event of type exit, and this generator will only return one thing one time, which is processor.switch, and it'll run it. So we're saying the first time we reach an exit event of this type, run processor.switch. And then the next time, the generator won't return anything. And if the generator doesn't return anything, it will assume that it's just a vanilla exit and it will exit the simulation entirely, including like your Python. It'll just exit. Uh, so you can imagine here if, let's say, we had another exit event in the middle somewhere for that case, we want to do a print statement. We could put, we could specify our print statement inside this generator here, and then it would do, okay, switch processor the first time, and then print the next time. We could have another one here, exit event generator dot, uh, let's say user interrupt for just sake of picking one. And then we can say, okay, if a user interrupts, user interrupt is hit, let's uh, at the very least, uh, dump our stats before we're doing anything stupid. So we'll dump our stats here. If you interrupt, we at least get the stats output. So this is a more concise way of handling exit events and simulator. Uh, I feel like I talked a lot there. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Anything to do, I suppose, with the simulator or exit events or a simulation loop? Yeah? Uh, so like that, that list there, have like two M5 exits in your code, or then like have one event there. Kind of. Well, I mean, it's up to you. Uh, you could have two, but if you only have two M5 exit events, you're probably never going to exit the simulation, right? I mean, just sorry, just sort of, want to do this uh, generator, for example, if I have like an amount of M5 exits, but I want every time I exit to switch the CPU. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, like, yeah, so that's. You'd have to write. Use a generator. So a generator isn't a function. Yeah. It's an iterator. So you can have like a while loop in a generator. Okay. That 
continually does the exact same thing every single time that it happens. So yeah. So you could. Uh, this this is just the reason. I, which one way this? Which one way this? So, yeah. Uh, good point. I think next time I teach this, right? I'm gonna. I think this. Have, I like this because it's you can fit it on one line. But you can just have a. You can define your generator up here, and it would be like def my generator, and then you can Google Python generators for for, for the syntax. But essentially, a, a generator will run until it reaches a yield statement. Uh, and then you can kind of put that, if you want, in your example, to put that in like an infinite loop. So it will be while while true switch switch cores yield yield, and then it will go back around the next time you do do. But sometimes you might want to flip flop, like you might want every second exit event to do something, not for, for some reason. There's an inf the po the reason I keep going for, for like some reason or like whatever you want. These it's because we try to make this as flexible as possible because people want to exit and do different things, and this is just a way of handling that in a more concise way. Uh, there's some examples in the Gen5 repository. Uh, configs, examples, Gen5 library, some of those scripts use uh, exit events and generators to do the things that they need, they, they need to do. I believe later on in this example, in this tutorial, I'm going to show you using exit events in a slightly different way. So um, you can look and come, so by this point in your program, it should, you should be able to execute that and you can try, it'll start. I mean, it, it should do, and assuming you haven't configured anything wrong, but this, will take a long time to complete. I would say with the, I would estimate like 40 minutes maybe uh, to, to, to like complete because the operating system is, uh, just takes a while to boot and then you got to get to that point. And then by the time point you got that point, it's actually a relatively quick simulation because you're only really switching, printing a statement, sleeping, and then going back. So simulations, major pitfall. It's excruciatingly slow. Uh, well, we have some benchmark applications that you can't, that will take weeks to complete if run in certain conditions. Uh, generally, as rule of thumb, I say for each second of simulate, if you want to sim simulate it one second simulated, will take about over 100,000 simulations on the host machine. So 100,000, over 100,000 seconds on the host machine. And that's a low ball estimate. I think you can get up to probably a million dependent on certain configurations. So it's slow. And that and simulation is always going to be slow, slower than the real world, real, real world hardware. I mean, the way I think of it is every single ISA that you execute inside the simulation is a function that needs to be called which in and of itself is executing several tens or hundreds of instructions. So there's a scale up. Fortunately, there are workarounds. And essentially, you should think of simulation like this. You're always trading off the fidelity of your simulation via the simulation time. Fidelity in the quality or the accuracy compared to a real world simulation. Okay, so you can have a very fast, quote, fast simulation that simulates almost nothing. Or you can have a very slow simulation that simulates almost everything to as much detail as you really desire. But the key idea behind this is, hey, your whole this this applies across your simulation. You don't need to simulate everything perfectly in your simulation. As I said before, very common example, booting the OS. You don't you don't care at all about the stats about booting the OS most of the time. You want to get to your benchmark application to really see what your component can do. And that's the part you want the high fidelity and everything else can be low, can be low, low fidelity. And I purposely peppered this uh, tutorial with, uh, exa with examples of speeding up and slowing down. So we're gonna go remind ourselves of these things. So some techniques we, we provide. SE mode, I'm gonna put this in here. Technically speeds things up because you don't have to worry about syscalls or the OS boot or anything like that. If you if your application is simple enough, you can run it in SE mode. So you don't need to worry about this, all the stuff associated with full system execution. You can just run it in SE mode and use your host OS as syscalls most of the time. Different CPU models uh, have different levels of fidelity. So, um, you know, Atomic's quite fast, but it's not 
when you're not really simulating very much if you use the atomic core. Uh, all three CPU, out of order, modeling an out of order core. Uh, very, very slow, but much more accurate results. Checkpoints, you're, we're gonna, I'm kind of gonna introduce checkpoints after this, but uh, if any of you are video game players, it's exactly the same concept. You take a point, you save the state of a machine, your, your machine, you, set, you save it literally to a file, and you can load from that file later on. So the example is uh, taking a checkpoint right before your region of interest, that is the code you're really interested in simulating, and then you can always restore to that point in the program, so you don't need to do everything that comes before it which could be substantial. KVM mode, again, this is related to our CPU models. Uh, I discussed this earlier. If you've got a machine capable of doing this, that is a host machine, uh, you can run using KVM cores that use uh, the kernel virtual machine to run, as, yeah, uh, run your uh, instructions. Uh, I essentially shorthand this to saying it's kind of using your host machine CPU instead of a simulated CPU. Uh, everything else is simulated, but that isn't. So you can boot the OS in like a matter of seconds because all the heavy stuff is being done by your host machine. Last one here, haven't discussed at all because this is what I want to be the next part is sim points. Um, so Hands up here, anyone who has even heard of SimPoints before. Great, two, I know Matt has. Yeah, you have, it, oh, that, the, he did this, he did this, like, not sure. Uh, we have someone here who I know knows a lot about SimPoints. Why don't you start us off with a couple of sentences and what SimPoints are? It, it can simulate the, um, the most representative region of the whole simulation to predict the uh, performance of the whole um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, so said it will simulate the most representative parts of this, of the, let's say, let's for a second, let's say binary execution, whatever, uh, the, the simulation. And then you can extrapolate those findings to the rest of the program. So the point is you're not, necessarily simulating all of your run, you're jumping around to various parts and only simulating the parts you need, and then inferring from that what the total, uh, let's say, execution time would otherwise be. Uh, well worth reading the paper on this. Um, so the idea in Gen 5 is you uh, have your sim points uh, infrastructure, you load in, and then you, check, you divide your application up into regions, uh, at this point, we're going to assume this is done for you. This is done with different tooling. So you divide your application up into uh, regions, and then you can take a checkpoint. At the you can run it once, take a checkpoint at the beginning of each region, and then only run the regions that you care about that are representative of your actual what you're actually interested in. So I'm going to go through some examples, which should make this slightly clearer. I think it's actually easier to understand when it's written in code. Uh, discuss what is some point. And I will say there's this kind of, um, is it fair to say it's an extension of uh, some points, loop points? Anyway, yeah, there's this, the, one of the big drawbacks of some points is it only works on single core setups and loop points came along and improved this and now it can work on multi-core setups. Uh, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but there's just, there is a tutorial on this afternoon in Ottermont 1. Uh, for people who are interested in loop points, uh, Gen 5 will make a uh, guest appearance to show how loop points work in Gen 5. I'm going to talk about sim points here. So I've provided like a bare bones structure for uh, sim points to go for open up materials, sim points, checkpoints. Uh, you should see most of a program here. Uh, I believe the only thing missing is uh, setting up the board. If, I'm, if my example is correct. So yeah, the idea here in this, in this example is we're going to run an application and take checkpoints at the beginning of each region. And then via another script, we can load the regions we care about and run them to get the data we care about. So at least this 
A check point is just saving the state of the application of your, of, sorry, of your simulation. Where you can plug it back in. And when I say the state of your simulation, I don't mean the state of your architecture. I mean the state of the, it basically will, it does a bit more than this, but essentially it saves everything stored in memory and uh, other registers and things, and then loads that back into your simulation layer point. You can, you can reconfigure your simulation between uh, showing check points. Sim points are, is a technique more than a, more than anything else for improving simulation time by essentially doing analysis on a workload and breaking it up into representative regions. So you only run, so then you can go back afterwards and go, okay, after our analysis, we found the only region, we only need to re run region one, three, and four to infer the statistics that we need. Yes, so this is what this part's doing. We're saying, you know, we need all the checkpoints for this thing, for this application we're running. And then we can do the real analysis. And the good thing with, we only need to do this once, and then we can go back and think. You can, I mean, this isn't, this is, in a sense, this is generalizable. There's multiple reasons you might want to take checkpoints to different parts of, different parts of an application's run. I'm inserting sim points here because this is central to the sim pointing methodology. Um, so in the kind of blank spot in the application I've given you, which essentially it comes down to the way we want to set the workload. Um, so you will have done the analysis to deter, um, sorry, uh, Zhang Tong, can you help me out here? How do you get the sim point data in the first place? What's a good explanation of that? Yeah, I definitely should have included a slide on this, my bad, because uh, I always have trouble thinking about how to explain this in my head. Yes, so essentially this goes back to you do an analysis on the application you're running and you get this data back. And essentially this is the raw data that a uh, point analysis will give you. What is your interval? Uh, that is uh, how uh, big your regions are. Uh, what is your... What is the warm up interval? The sim point list is the. I know it's really hard to explain, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, it's it's representative regions. Yes. Am I? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, as in, you have region one, region two, region three, region four, region five, all the way up to, in this case, region 15. And these are the ones that we care about because they're the representative ones. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense when you actually say that. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, once you do your analysis, you figure out the regions you actually care about. So, in this example here, this application has been split up into various regions of each having an interval of, um, what's that, like, a hundred a million uh, instructions. And uh, we're saying, hey, uh, there's only four intervals we actually care about in this program here, uh, region two, three, four, and 15. Those are the only ones that are going to give us representative data of this application running. These are the weights because different regions have different levels of um, represent.
How about now? I think that's working. Yep, that's working. Great. All right. Thanks, Bobby, for all your hard work thus far. Uh, as he said, my name is Matt, and I am going to talk about the support in Gem5 for running a variety of GPU experiments. So my intent, uh, as you know, some parts of this were earlier today, is for this to be interactive. However, I do want to give one caveat up front that uh, the code space that you've been using thus far will not work with the GPU support. I'll explain why in a moment. But what that means is if your uh, you know, machine has Docker support on it, you should be good to go and able to follow along. And I'll have gaps as we go to, to help with that. But if you don't, then I'll show some examples on my laptop of how this works. And uh, yeah, ultimately, similar to Bobby before, please feel free to interrupt as we're going. You know, Like I said, I want this to be interactive. I want people to be able to run these experiments as I run them. Uh, and so if you're having problems, I can't promise you that I've seen them before, but, you know, there's a general common, you know, set of problems that people seem to run into running this the first time. So hopefully we'll be able to, to work through that together. A couple of disclaimers. So right now, AMD, or sorry, uh, Gem5 only supports AMD GPUs. Ultimately, the concepts are, in terms of hardware, are similar to NVIDIA GPUs, but uh, while we're working on adding NVIDIA GPU support right now, we're running NVIDIA, or sorry, AMD GPUs. Second, we are running general purpose GPU or GP GPU workloads. So if you're looking to run something like Vulkan or OpenGL, we don't have any support for that uh, as is. Um, so I just want to make sure those caveats are clear kind of up front. Um, Second, as uh, Bobby mentioned, there's a large group of people, including many students of mine uh, and myself, who have listed at the bottom there, as well as a bunch of collaborators at AMD Research, including you know those listed on the screen, but especially uh, Matt Peremba, uh, Brad Beckman, Tony Gutierrez, and Alex Dutu, who've done a lot of work on this as well. And so, you know, this presentation is sort of coalescing pieces that my group have done, pieces that AMD have done uh, together. So in terms of making it interactive, ultimately, the way that we're going to run GPU models in Gem5 in SE mode is we're going to be using Docker support for that. And in the next few slides, I am going to um, walk you through why and how we have that Docker support. But First things first, since this takes about 20 minutes to compile and we can you know, talk through the rest of it while we're going, um, I'm gonna pause here so folks can get a, a moment to do it. But what we're gonna do is we're going to pull a Docker, uh, which is listed here. It is gcrio slash gem5 tests slash gcn GPU slash version v21.1. Um, that will take about a minute on most machines to pull. And once that's done, we are going to actually compile Gem5 to run uh, to the command to build the GPU support. So I'm going to pause here. Maybe I'll uh, you know, walk around if needed to help people. But uh, like I said, all you should need to do this is a terminal. You don't need to have an AMD GPU on your machine. As long as you have any uh, you know, CPU on your machine, you should be able to pull the Docker and run this command. So are there any questions about any of this or anything I can do to help uh, as we run that command? I can also walk around the room if that would help and, and check to make sure people are, are getting what they need here. Yeah. So I am pulling the Docker will not clone Gem5. I'm assuming here that you've already cloned it. I didn't know that. I don't think that might be a good thing. They are like a similar statement. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. You got it. And in the next few slides, I'm going to talk through all of that 
it's just uh, since this takes 20 minutes, I want everybody to have it going in the background while we while we work through everything. Depends how many cores you have. So if you have a hundred cores, maybe maybe 10, 15. If you have five cores, maybe a little bit. <laughs> If you have a single card to do, yeah, I don't know. Um, what was the other question? Sorry. Oh, no, I have a question. Just so you need to put your five first, like in that uh, row. Oh, sorry, in, in the software image. For the second step, we are assuming that you've cloned Gem 5. Yes. Okay. But if you already have Gem 5 cloned, then in the second step, you should just be able to see the YouTube. So for those online, uh, between after pulling the Docker and before CDing to Gem 5, I am assuming that you've cloned uh, Gem 5 on your machine already. Since, uh, you know, many of you had done that already earlier with Bobby, I, I sort of glossed over that step. So I apologize for the, the confusion. And maybe I don't want to, you know, switch from my screen here, but uh i do have like this all set up to run on my browser as well but just since i know people are are copying the commands here uh, i won't switch over anything else i can do to help with this before we move on We'll give folks a minute to keep running these commands. So maybe just to uh to be explicit, I'll put in the clone command quick. Well, well folks are, are running that. Okay, hopefully that helps uh, clarify that part for everybody. Anybody need more time with this? Okay, I'll give folks maybe one more minute to get these commands running then. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, ultimately the goal is that this runs and compiles in the background for everybody for the next few minutes while we we talk about what all these uh, what all this gobbledygook on the screen means basically. So I'll uh, I'll do another lap around the room just to see if folks need help before I move on. Question? Yeah, what's up? Okay, so this is a every every university every company has their own thing here. At least for me, what I have to do is I actually have my interface have to start Docker. So I can show you the command that I run. I don't know if this is uh, the same for your institution or not, but this is the exact same failure me, me, my students and I get. So maybe maybe your institution has the same issue. So at my institution, the first time you start up a machine, uh, you need to run a command like this, system control user start Docker service. Um, here, I'll make it bigger. Yep. Uh, Again, this is a institution specific thing, but in, in my institution, at least, this is a command I have to run to get Dark Docker up and running. So you might try the same, see if that is uh, something your institution needs as well. <laughs> 
in the meantime, while uh, while they're uh, running that command, does anybody else need help before I progress? Go ahead, I'm listening. I'm just giving her a minute to to copy that down, but then I'll I'll switch back. Besides that, is there, yeah, let me see if I can uh, I can put them side by side or something. Anyone else I can help while we're, while we're getting the command running? Okay, well, why don't we move forward at least so folks can see what's up and then uh, we won't take advantage of parallelism here. We'll just, we'll just move forward. So ultimately, if uh, slash when the internet here enables you to run it, when you run that last command, the, the Docker run command at the bottom, what that's going to do is that's going to compile, excuse me, the uh, GCN3 x86 build, which is one of the GPU models that we have. And ultimately, what I'm gonna touch on, while hopefully that's running in the background for everybody, is first what all of that means, why we're doing it this way, as opposed to the way that Bobby talked to you about this morning, uh, and then talk a bit about doing this all in SE mode versus FS mode. So the reason why we're adding the support the way that we're doing it is that modeling GP workloads requires supporting a number of things. And kind of in the bottom right of this uh, slide, you can see that um, we have kind of that yellow box and that yellow box is actually what gem five is. All of those other boxes, the application source, MI open, rock plus, hip, hips libraries and so on and so forth. Those are pieces of the driver and runtime stack that AMD GPUs are running. So the gray box in the top left, that's your application. That's the thing you want to run. So you're doing vector addition or matrix multiply or whatever it might be. And all of those other boxes in between are the things that actually happen for a real GPU program that get it to run on that GPU. Um, and so that means in Gem 5 that we need to support all of those different pieces. Uh, and so that is what happens with the GPU model. Now you might be thinking, um, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. Another way to view this is that we have our application with say a machine learning library like MI Open underneath that. Um, and below that, you might have libraries for BLOSS routines to do linear algebra, for example, or OpenCL or other kinds of code. And ultimately for AMD GPUs, all of that sits on top of their Rockham stack, which is Radeon Open Compute. And the Rockham stack is what the device drivers are. That's what's actually controlling whatever you wanna do on the GPU. And in my experience, getting all of this up and running and playing nicely with Gem 5 is a lot of work uh, and it's very error prone and tedious. And that is where um, you know, the support with this Docker comes in. But just to give you a brief background with that Rockham stack, your runtime layer for the GPU is what they call Rock R or Rockham runtime. Thunk is the user space driver, which they call Rock T, Rock K, is their kernel fusion driver. And then like I said, on top of that, we have a number of libraries to run linear algebra, machine learning, uh, you know, GPU programming more broadly. But the key takeaway with all this is that Gem5 is simulating basically all of these with the exception of the kernel, Rock K, which is going to emulate when we're in SE mode and when we're in FS mode, it will actually simulate. Now, like I said, getting all of that right is big pain in the butt. And that is why we have Docker resources. So that Docker that you all pulled as the first step on a few slides ago, what that's doing is it's creating an environment where all of this stuff has been installed and put in exactly the right format for you um, to use. And so all of those experiments, when we ran that Docker pull command, what it's really telling us with the GCN GPU is it's specifically identifying Gem5's GPU Docker 
And by putting the V22 minus one at the end, it's saying we want support for version 22.1, which is our most recent version. Um, and you know, maybe to put it simply, you can up install and, and download everything and get it running without this Docker if you so, so choose. But I strongly recommend that you go this way when using SE mode, because like I said, it is very error prone and difficult to get exactly right. Uh, and we've been, you know, working, you know, on continuously adding support into Gem5 to make this work well, providing a large number of benchmarks, but, and those are all in the Gem5 resources repo that Bobby alluded to before, and I'll show you a brief snapshot later. So having said all that, what is supported? So right now, we in SE mode, we support Rockham version 4.0. Uh, and that is well supported on stable. So if you run either stable or develop, running SE mode sh with GPU should work well. If you want to run full system mode or FS mode, we just released that starting with version 22.0. At the end of my talk today, I will uh, give a brief primer on how to use that. Um, but there are some key differences between them, which I'll touch on at that point. In terms of the actual GPUs that we support, right now we support GCN3, which we run GFX801 and 803. Uh, 801 is for cache coherent tightly coupled G GPUs or APUs. 803 is for discrete GPUs. So depending on what, you're, what system you're trying to model, you would pick the appropriate one of those. And for the next generation of GPU beyond that, the Vega uh, system that AMD has, we support GFX 900 for the discrete GPUs and 902 for APUs. Although the 902 support is partial because the AMD machine learning libraries don't, uh, don't support APUs. So if you're trying to run machine learning workloads, uh, a 902 will not probably, well, it might work, I guess is the right way to say it. It is, uh, as the library developers put it, best effort support. So it might not be the most efficient, but in theory, it might, it'll work. Um, and so ultimately, the key point I wanna make here is if you're trying to compile your code and run your code with the Vega model, you need to compile your code for the appropriate generation of architecture and vice versa. So if you wanna run GCN3, you have to compile it for GCN3. Um, you know, the big thing here though, is we don't yet have support for the standard library. So instead we have apusd.py and gpufs.py, which are the scripts that we use to launch these jobs. Um, and right now we only support Ruby. I know Bobby talked uh, a bit about classic versus Ruby earlier in the, in the tutorial. Um, the GPU support only uses Ruby, so, but my group has done work on trying to, to port over some of the common features, for example, using all the different replacement policies that Classic has. So you're now able to use that kind of stuff, but you can't use Classic uh, by its own. And for the SE part, we're gonna focus on GCN3 and GFX801 because this is the best tested support we have. Although the other ones, by and large, should work. So I alluded to this on the previous slide, but ultimately we have two models in Gem5 we support, APUs and DGPUs. Um, as a side note, AMD's uh, syntax, if you will, when talking about caches is uh, different, just like NVIDIA has their own syntax as well. So when you see them in the files talk about an SQC, SQC means the L1i cache, TCP means the L1d cache, and TCC means the unified shared L2 uh, cache. So ultimately that is the kind of support we provide. And like I said, depending on what you wanted to study, discrete GPUs or cache coherent APUs, we have support for both in our systems. But a common question I get is, okay, you know, once we got this up and running, where is actually the code that I would want to go and muck around with, you know, as I add support for new features. So I wanna briefly touch on that. Um, just, you know, to, to, to inform what's going to come next. So if you want to look at GCN or Vega specific code, you would go into source arch AMD GPU, source GPU compute. That is where the actual core models. So if you want to look at how the compute units or the instruction buffers or the registers or whatever it is you might want to, you know, mess around with, that's where you would look. 
for the MEP cache coherence protocol that's in source mem protocol or source mem Ruby um, and source dev HSA. This is where all of the device models for the system come in. So if you are uh, you know, trying to change different pieces of the code, here are some of the key places you should look. The second thing I wanted to touch on in this space is, well, what does it actually mean to run a kernel on a GPU? So maybe just out of curiosity, who here has run a GPU program before? Not too many, okay. So when you run a program on any accelerator, including a GPU, what really happens is your host, the CPU usually, is going to offload a command via packets to the GPU saying, or the other accelerator saying, hey, here's some work I would like you to do. And so what happens then is the GPU will inspect that packet and say, oh, okay, here's the, the code they want me to run with the resources it requires me to run. And I'm gonna schedule that work off on my resources and then tell you when it's done. So at a very high level, that is the interface for running a program on any GPU, whether it be Qualcomm, you know, ARM, AMD, NVIDIA, you know, Samsung, whoever's GPU that you're, you're running on, they use some, some, of inter some form of interface very similar to that. Um, and the way that we model this in Gem5 is we actually have user space software that'll talk to the GPU. And that's where the, the purple box at the top right of the slide comes in. And it will communicate via rock K with gem five, which again, remember in SE mode, we're emulating in FS mode, we actually fully simulate. And all of those ioctal commands that are telling the GPU what to do are encapsulated there. So that's how we get the command of what we want to do to the GPU. Once we've done that inside the GPU, we have this embedded microprocessor called a command processor or a CP that's going to take that work in and then schedule it onto the device. And so we do this, as I mentioned before, using a number of queues where we'll enqueue those packets. So there's a lot more details and Gem5 sort of tries to fully model all of the different pieces of this that, that the CP and the interface can do. And that means that if you care about all of the stuff that happens not just inside your kernel that runs on the GPU, but also all of the work to offload and onload the work between the host and the accelerator, Gem5 models that at a high level of accuracy because we model all of the pieces that, that do this. Uh, and if you're curious on the code, there's some links to where you can find it. So I alluded to this already on the previous slide, but once the command processor has gotten your work, it's going to then dispatch your work to the compute units to run on by keeping track of how many resources you need and where things should go. And again, um, there's some links here to the code if you want to, to dig into that. Um, and so once we've done that, then we actually run the instructions through the pipeline stages of our processor. Um, so we have the fetch, scoreboard, schedule, execute, and the memory pipeline. Uh, and of course, then it will write back once that's done. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but if you want to look through the code for those pieces, I have some links to where you can find it. Okay, so I wanted to make sure with all that that I provided at least enough background for you to understand where pieces and what they do. But let's act, come back to what we started with at the very beginning and use those commands to run things. So hopefully by now, just show of hands, people were able to get the, the Docker Hold, yes, no, again, what was the error or what is the error? Anybody else any problems I can help with there? Okay. So maybe I'll show you what happens on my terminal when we run this command. Um, so ultimately, when we run this command, let me get this out of the way. So what I have here, let me use clear, is a, a screen set up just for Gem5. And if we were to build it, I'm gonna use just a lot of threads on the server just to make it go fast. 
we run our manned. Oops, let me just copy it. Yes, I will work on that one moment. Okay, there we go. So I just have a screen set up where to for the demo. And um, we you can see I'm in the gem five folder. So now I can go ahead and just run that command. In my case, I'm just going to use a obscenely large amount of threads to make sure this gets done in a short amount of time. Um, but ultimately, it will go through and compile Gem 5, much like you've seen with Bobby in, in earlier demos today. So I'm going to let that go in the background while I go back to the slides quick to just talk about what's going on. So within this command, what the Docker is doing is essentially it's telling us what volume and what working directory we're using, which in this case are gem five. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Docker, essentially that's telling us what space the, the Docker is gonna, gonna use and assume uh, when it's trying to run this compilation. And then we're going to use the exact same path, the GCRIO gem five test, GCN GPU, is telling us to take the Docker we pulled earlier, and then within it, we are going to run our build command, which should look very similar to what Bobby showed you before, where we're just saying scans build GCN3 uh, gem5 opt, which builds the GCN3 GPU model. Um, so let's check in the background. Uh, ultimately, once that command is run, you should see this. Uh, you know, up to date or build the command at the end, which tells us that we're good to go. Um, so maybe uh, I know folks said that they had some problems pulling the Docker, so I'll just use, I'll just show on my screen what's happening as we go forward. The first thing I tell someone to use if they're interested in using the GPU model is to run this benchmark that we call Square. And just for everyone's benefit, Square is in Gem5 resources. It is probably one of the most popular pages in Gem5 resources. Um, and what Square is, it's just, it's just a simple vector addition program. So that means every thread is just doing A of I plus B of I, and you're storing the result in C of I. Uh, and if you know GPU programming, you might know that this is ideally suited to run on the GPU because it's perfectly parallel. Every thread can operate without any interference from another thread. Uh, and because this is a very popular program, we actually create a pre-built binary for you, so you don't have to build it. However, you can go through and do that building process uh, if you so choose. Um, so what we're going to do here then is we're actually just going to um, pull that binary. So what I, you would do in this case, I am going to make a binary outside the gem5 folder, binary directory outside the gem5 folder, and um, I am just going to pull my command. Oop, sorry, sorry about that. So I'm going to then pull this pre-built binary that we have in Gem5. And you can see, because I now pulled it, a copy into this directory already that I ended up making more than one copy. But square here is the name of our binary that we're going to run. So now that we've done that, what we're going to do is we're actually going to run the Docker command, which again, I will walk us through before we do. But what the Docker command here does, again, it has the same Docker, the V22 one that we downloaded before, and it's running the gem5 opt binary that we made before. And in this case, because we're running in SE mode, we're going to use that base configuration script that we talked that I mentioned before, apusc.py. 
You might also note that it has a minus N3. What this does is it tells the system to run with three CPU thread contexts. And the reason why we need this is the Rockham stack, those drivers that we're running, they actually use multiple threads in their uh, multiple processes, basically, um, to do the various commands that Rockham uses. So if you ever run a GPU program and it seems like it's just sitting there hanging before you ever got to any GPU code, it's usually because you didn't run it with enough thread context. So uh, one of our common tricks is we always just bump that up a little bit to see if that solves the problem. And then finally, at the end, we are specifying the path to the binary, which remember I just put in the bin directory. So now what I can do, I am in my directory that has gem5 and the bin here, um, and I can then paste in my command and it will run. Uh, and so this is going to run that square benchmark with a relatively small input size. And the uh, you know the the bottom line here is because square is this silly uh, you know, relatively trivial simple problem, and because uh, we're using a very small input size, it should take less than five minutes to run in Gem Five. And I know many of you brought up with Bobby in the last session, like why would you ever want to run something so small in Gem Five? You are of course welcome to you know kick up the input size to obscenely large levels with millions or billions of. Uh, you know, input values. I'm just trying to pick a small size to to show for a demo today. So, do people want me to pause here to try and run this along? I know uh, many of you said that there was some you know space constraints getting the Docker downloaded and everything. So, if that's the case, I can just keep showing the demos here. But if people want, I can pause so they have a chance to run the same command. So, do people want me to pause here, or should I? Should I keep going? Okay. So in the background, again, I'll let this keep running and we'll, we'll show the results in a moment. Likewise, since people are having um, you know, some issues getting things running on their own laptops, I'll, I'll maybe just summarize this. But within the GPU model, there's many parameters you could choose to tweak. And one very common one is the register allocation scheme. So ultimately, one of the things that decides how you schedule work when you run it on the device, when you run it on the GPU, is how many, how many, what kind of resources do you need? So how many registers do you need? How much LDS or scratch bed do you need? How many thread contexts do you need? How many wavefront slots do you need? All of these different things will tell you essentially what the limit, what the maximum number of, of simultaneous things, and the things in this case mean threads, that you can run on the GPU at that time. Um, and so by default, when AMD released their support for the GPU model, they released it with what they call the simple register allocation policy. And what the simple allocation policy does is it says we only let one wavefront or one bundle of threads run on a CU at a time. Uh, and the reason why they did that is that it gives you very few stalls and very little contention because you don't have many things running in parallel on a CU at a time. But it's also not very realistic with respect to how a real GPU behaves, because if you've heard about GPUs before, you might know the whole goal is to run as many things as we can in parallel on them at a time to try and hide uh, the memory latency through thread level and memory level parallelism. So if our register allocation scheme is not letting us run all of that stuff in parallel, then we're not doing a very good job of mimicking how the real system behaves. And so what my students did and I did is we added in what we call a dynamic policy, which says whatever the max number of wavefronts that can run on a CU, as long as resources are available, I'm going to keep allowing more wavefronts to run on a compute unit. And in this case, the default is 40. So that means for every compute unit in my system, which you know, modern systems have, you know, 64 to 128, maybe 256 compute units, each of them could be running 40 bundles of threads simultaneously. So you can do the math. That's a lot of a lot of threads that we're running here. And naturally, this means that we're going to have more contention because now they're going to be fighting for resources. They're all going to be trying to issue requests. There might be more stalls that come from them. Uh, but we can actually model this. So in Gem5 on the command line, if you use the regalloc policy flag, 
it'll let you specify if you want to use this dynamic or simple scheme. Um, and what I'd hope to do is have everybody run them themselves and see how those policies change. But I know folks are having some issues with that. So we will, I'll we'll just show you what the results will be. But in the meantime, just to, to circle back to our you know, live demo here with Square, you can see that it ran to completion. It took, uh, you know, and it tells us that it passed with the checking that it does. And just to, to um, you know, show the point that I was making before, we can show or we can change our register alloc policy on the command line like so. By default, it's going to use the dynamic one because that's more representative of what a real GPU does. But if you want, you could use the simple one like so. And of course, this is just one of many different inputs you might consider to do. Having said that, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, short answer is yes. So the question was, does a real GPU actually have 40 wavefront slots per C? Yes. Um, at least the GPUs that this that we're mimicking here have that many. Um, yep, yeah, that's a great point. And that's uh that's part of the the scheme here. So the the question was like, do we need registers for each of those? And the answer is yes. And uh, that is why in GPUs, the register file is you know many times bigger than the register file on a CPU because we are, running so many things in parallel and we want, and we're gonna give each of them register resources. Um, so I don't have the exact number about size on the top of my head, but I think the max is each of those wavefront uh, slots can have either 128 or 256 threads per register. And so if you're assuming say 64 threads per wavefront, you can do the math about how big your register file is gonna be then. For each CU, yes. So these register files are are not like the CPUs that Bobby uh, was telling you about this morning. They are much, much bigger because that's uh, that's the way that GPUs are designed, basically. Yes, great question. So I didn't show it, but just like we are adjusting the register allocation policy, you can also adjust the size of your register file. So that means. If you wanted to give it, you know, a, a, a hundred gigabyte register file, and Gem Five would allow that. Of course, a hundred gigabyte register file is not super practical with relative to a real GPU, but there is that option to make and to configure and make it bigger. Um, and I'm not gonna, you know, get into the details today, but my group is working on designing very, very highly validated configurations similar to the ones that. Bobby talked about with these known good configurations. Um, we are likewise working on that in my lab to, to release those so that you have uh, you know, realistic register file sizes, if you will. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So naturally you might think, well, you know, dynamic actually lets us run stuff in parallel. It must be much more accurate, but um, the way that we would have checked that is you look in the stats, as Bobby said, it's a, a big text file right now, and you'd specifically look for shader active ticks that tells you essentially how many cycles the compute units were running in this program. Um, but surprisingly, if you actually go through and you run a large variety of benchmarks, including Square, it turns out that the register allocation schemes are, uh, the dynamic one is actually slightly worse, which is non-intuitive. Um, when I ran these numbers originally, you would expect that the dynamic one would be a lot better. Um, and what it highlights is while we fixed the register allocation scheme to be more accurate, fixing that in isolation is not sufficient. So you need to actually go and then fix the dependence tracking, which is what's controlling those stalls that happen. Um, and so my group has put in uh, some fixes to help handle this extra contention that the dynamic policy causes in terms of stalls, but it's definitely an area where more research is needed if people are interested in uh, you know, contributing there. And just to give you an idea of many of the benchmarks that are available in Gem 5 resources, my group ran uh, uh, you know, some tests and you can see that Although there are cases where the dynamic register allocation is better, especially in the middle of the screen, there's also a few of them where it's much, much worse because of these extra stalls and contention that is caused. 
Uh, and hopefully, if uh, and when you're able to get the Docker downloaded and you run these same commands, you can see on your own just by changing that one flag that you get similar results to this. And that's where I want to end the SE mode part of the talk and, and spend the rest of it talking about GPUFS because while I've talked about one application today, in Gem5 resources, we actually have a number of them, which I want to, to switch over and show for a moment. Um, so if you're interested in doing GPU re research, as I mentioned, here is Square. So Square is uh, the, you know, the first test that I recommend you run. And all of the steps here that you'll see are exactly what I went through with everyone today. But if you go to the main page of Gem5 Resources, you can see that we have uh, a number of other benchmarks here, some of which are the ones Bobby talked to you about before. But we also have, starting here with DNNMark, Heterosync, HIP sample tests, Lulash, and so on, and, and Pinocha benchmarks, and so on and so forth. We have a number of different GPU tests and resources available here. So if you're interested in doing GPU research, you don't have to start from scratch. There's a whole bunch of stuff we've done that you can um, you can use to get started uh, and, and bootstrap on your own. And many of these, as uh, I think Bobby mentioned before, but we use to actually regress the model on a, on a per commit daily and weekly basis. So pretty good chance that these things will should work on the on the tip of develop out of the box. So in the last uh, you know eight minutes or so here, I'm going to talk about switching from SE mode to FS mode. But are there any other questions with SE mode before we switch gears? Maybe a very high level question I should have asked to start. Why AMD GPUs? Um, so, there, you know, maybe to get in, to, to avoid getting into, you know, company politics, oh. AMD Research uh, is a company that uses Gem, or a research, you know, lab that uses Gem5 and they have contributed their code back, similar to how ARM research has contributed their code back. Uh, you know, if tomorrow NVIDIA research decides they'd like to contribute that code back, I'm pretty sure Jason and I will, will happily take it. Uh, you know, I don't want to speak for Jason, but I would certainly happily take it. But, uh, you know, it's ultimately about who is contributing the the code back to the community, right? Yeah, um, about, sorry, about the, the register files and stuff you were talking about, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, that is what if need and also talks to you about, like how you should model that. Let me clarify there, yeah. So, so that register file, the dynamics allocation scheme I mentioned, that is not something that AMD or NVIDIA has told us to do, or that is the right way to do it. That is the way my students and I designed it because it seemed like a, a sane way of designing it. However, there is an entire field of how to design register allocation schemes for GPUs. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but there's a professor at the University of Pittsburgh in particular who's done a bunch of really good work on this space. And, you know, my hope is someday that we can integrate all of those different schemes in. There's no reason we can't. Uh, it's just, again, a matter of, of time and resources and where we focus on. So, no, the REST calculation scheme there is not, I didn't intend to make it sound like that's what AMD or NVIDIA does. It's uh, an independent scheme that my students and I came up with. Good question. Anybody else? Okay. So we, as I mentioned, we also now have support for full system mode simulation. Um, and, you know, this is really actually a big step because one of the challenges with using a C mode, we talked about needing to use this Docker for everything, which is big and, and painful. Um, but another challenge is every time the software developers update their version of Rockham, we would actually have to go in and try to update Gem5 accordingly to support, you know, whatever model, whatever version of Rockham they have, which is a very slow, uh, tedious process. And the one of the really nice features about our GPUFS support is we don't have to go back and do that since it actually simulates all of those device driver things that I alluded to before. We can actually support like this, the latest and greatest versions of Rockham as they come out, which, uh, you know, one of the folks at AMD, I think last week when we were preparing this, he actually just went and downloaded the, the, the absolute newest version of Rockham and we were able to run it in Gem5. Um, there are a few caveats that I want to mention. So right now it only supports x86's KVM CPU. 
as you heard from from Bobby this morning, there's a whole bunch of other you know models that are in Gem five right now that those are not supported. Um, but and because it only supports the KVM CPU, that means it needs to run on a machine with KVM support that is x86. And we're working on adding support for other kinds of models. But if you have an x86 CPU with KVM support and you want to do GPU research, this is a big leap forward. Uh, I already mentioned how the Rock K, the driver, is going to be simulated now instead of emulated. But in GPUFS, we're actually also modeling things like virtual memory support and DMA engines and so on. Um, so if you're somebody you know, who works at the boundary of operating systems, for example, and you actually want to mess around with virtual memory allocation schemes, for example, you can do so in GPUFS and you can fully simulate that, which is a big uh, step forward. And just to graphically show you that, so the, the this picture should look similar to the one that I showed you before, but the difference now is all of those purple blocks. So all of the purple blocks between the CPU and the GPU, the PM4 packet processor, the host data bypass, the interrupt handler, the GPU virtual memory, and so on, all of those things are actually now modeled at high fidelity in Gem5 when we run with GPUFS. So while the architecture, you know, the compute units and the caching and the cache coherence and whatever are the same, the stuff that interfaces between the host and the device is now simulated at a much higher fidelity than it was before. And if you're somebody doing research on those things, you can now take advantage of that. Um, so while we don't need to use the Docker in the same way that we did before, there are two things that you do need to consider. And what those are, are a disk image and a Linux kernel. Um, and so we've integrated this into Gem5 resources, just the same as all those other benchmarks I just showed you. But the two key steps you need to run GPUFS is you need to have the disk image and the Linux kernel installed, which we have a readme that walks you through the steps of that. Uh, I'm not going to do that because it takes a couple hours to fully do all of that, and I don't have a couple hours to walk through all of that. So in the rest of the tutorial, I'm just going to assume that that support is there. But we have some pre-built uh, you know, images there that are linked here if you want to do GPU research that you can download um, just the same as we did Square a moment ago. Um, and so that means, like I said, that we're able to run many different versions of Rockham easily with this GPUFS support, including Rockham 4.3, Rockham 5.0, Rockham 5.4. Um, you do need to create the disk images for each of those versions, um, which we have a script that uses Packer to do, whereas the link on the previous page just downloads the, you know, the image and the kernels for a specific version of Rockham. If you want some other version of Rockham that's not supported, or sorry, that's not, that we don't have an image for already, you would have to go and create them, which we have some directions to do. Um, and that means that now we officially support, um, oh, sorry, we, get, we can support the Vega GPUs that are doing uh, full system mode. And so again, here, you would use uh, the scripts that we have that go with full system mode, in this case, Vega 10 KVM. Um, and as part of this transition, what we've been doing is we've really been focusing on supporting the Vega model because that is a newer GPU model that AMD has. Um, I haven't personally tried testing it with GCN3, but I suspect it would probably work, but your mileage may vary. So how would you go about doing this? Well, the first key thing to note is you don't actually need to use that Docker support that we talked about in the first half of GPU SC mode. Because you are downloading the kernel and the image as part of what you do here, you can just use the scans command on the command line, very similar to what Bobby showed you this morning, and that will uh, just compile the model. And the only difference here that you might notice is here, we're compiling the Vega x86 model as opposed to the GCN3 x86 model. So naturally, that is building Vega, the Vega GPU model instead. And just as a quick aside, um, you know, I don't know if this is implicit in the question you were asking before, but the reason why it's called GCN3 x86 and Vega x86 is because the AMD uh, CPUs are x86 CPUs. So I know there's a uh, a researcher at uh, Georgia Tech who has been working on trying to get Rockham to run with ARM CPUs, but 
uh, that is not officially supported in Gem5 at this point. So while you can build the Gem5 model without worrying for full system, without worrying about this support, um, you do likely want to use that Rockham stack to build and compile the apps. And this process works exactly the same as before. So we would pull our Docker app, our Docker repo, and then we would CD to Gem5 resources and make the application that we want to run, which since we're running short on time, I will skip over. But from there, you just go and run your application like you would, like we did with Square. The only difference is now we need to also tell Gem5 where that disk image and where the kernel that we're using with FS mode are. So in the, in the middle of the screen here, you can see we have a dash dash disk image and a dash dash kernel. Those are need to be specified for us to tell a full system mode what kernel and what disk image we're running on. But with that, we now get a lot more power. So a lot of these things like sim points and fast forwarding and all the other kind of stuff that Bobby was just telling you about in the previous session, with full system mode support for the GPU, we can now do the same thing. And so that means uh, potentially you could start running things like PyTorch and TensorFlow applications in GPUFS end to end. Again, as Bobby said, assuming you know you put in the appropriate checkpoints or that you're patient uh, with how long that takes. But again, I think that's a really big leap forward relative to the support we had. But regardless of what kind of applications you're trying to run, in SE mode or full system mode, we have pretty good support for both of them now for a variety of versions of Rockham. So uh, I know I've uh, ran over my time by a minute or two here, and I know Jason and Bobby wanted to do a, a wrap up with the last you know few minutes here. So uh, I'll stop here. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. If not, I'll turn the mic over to to Jason and Bobby. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so the question was how much slower or how much faster is SE versus FS? The, the um, yeah, well, so it the real answer there is it depends if you're using all of that checkpointing support, uh, uh, you know, and sim points and whatever. So if you're using that kind of support, FS mode can actually be, I want to say like, two orders of magnitude faster, assuming you've done all the fancy stuff to get it in the place you want. If you've not done any of that, yeah, it's at least twice as slow, if not five times as slow. Um, so yeah, like out of the box, if we were to run square, for example, like I have here, square would be slower in FS mode. But if I were to go in and create, you know, sim points and checkpoints and what have you, like Bobby talked about before, and we're gonna talk about this afternoon with the loop point stuff, then um, I'm trying to remember, I think the the best speed up we had was 284 times faster than, than running it in SE mode. But again, that assumes a lot of like support that you put on top of it that is not shown in this slide, basically. So we're, we're working on that. That's, you know, like Bobby said, hopefully in the next like six, six to 12 months, that kind of support will be released publicly. But in theory, if you're motivated, you could do that exact same thing yourself today because all the support is there now with the GPUFS support. Does that answer the question? Go ahead. Um, so how much effort does it take to use this uh, you know, platform and uh, make some enhancement or changes to the architecture, extend the ISA, uh, Schemes. So that's a great question. Um, the question was like, how much time does it take to, to add a new widget basically, where a new widget could be reg allocator or a new scheduling scheme or whatever. Um, you know, I'm biased here, but the kind of things you described, I don't think would be much harder than if you wanted to change a scheme like in the CPUs in Gem 5. So, you know, you, if you want to go in to give you an idea, the register allocator that my student put in, I think we put in like over the course of a week, where by over the course of a week, it was like, you know, one day of coding, one day of review, and like five days of testing, right? So 
Uh, and that includes like the review process, like getting it, you know, integrated into Gem 5 and everything. So like adding the register allocation scheme itself did not take a lot of time. Just like anything with Gem 5 though, it's about like understanding where you want to make the changes. And that is not something like, you know, magically overnight you can, you can intuit. So, you know, learning how to use Gem 5 as, you know, I know Bobby talked about this morning, that is where I would say, you know, the, the, the time would be spent. But once you've done that, and, you know, that's why I've tried to structure my slides like I did today to tell you like, oh, if I want to go mess around with this piece, here's the files I go and look at. Once you know that, I don't think the kind of changes you're describing are, are hugely, you know, time consuming. But just like any research project, you know, the scope can expand and become bigger and bigger depending on what you want to do, right? Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, so Jason, I know you only have about five, 10 minutes. Is there any wrap up that you two wanted to do? I'll just hold off. I, I, I please give it up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. I did have two slides, but I can basically sum up the conversation rather than having to do the whole kind of switch over again. Um, I kind of had the kind of wrap up remarks. I wish I could be ended by anything, anything to do with Gen 5. Uh, you know, we're quite, uh, we're quite honest about the limitations of Gen 5. And I suppose Gen 5 isn't a panacea for literally anything you want to do in, in like computer architecture research. There's a great paper called Computer Arc, uh, computer simulators considered harmful. I think that's the title. Great paper on when you should and shouldn't use simulation in your computer architecture uh, research. And we don't claim that Gen 5 can literally do anything. Uh, as was pointed out during the, uh, uh, as in via one of the questions asked earlier, we don't uh, ship Gen 5 with guarantees that these models represent uh, real world equivalents, but we are working on that to hopefully have something that's a bit more guaranteed in the future. Um, so these are two big kind of things that I like to leave people like it's a great tool, but realize realize the limitations and think closely about why you're using it. Lastly, uh, I just want to advertise like some avenues that we use to keep in contact with people who use use Gen Five. If you go to Gen Five with Org, uh, you can join our Slack channel. That's free for anyone to use, ask questions. We try to keep on top of questions people ask as much as possible. Um, that's the main outlet for the community right now. There's also a mailing list uh, that you can find via the website Gen5 Users, Gen5 Dev. Uh, users is for user related questions, Dev is for the, the uh, developers. So you guys probably want to go on users unless you're thinking of making some contribution to the project, which you're free to do so. Um, Maybe of interest to some of you guys in this group. Uh, this summer we'll be running a Gen5 bootcamp at UC Davis. A uh, five-day event, six hours a day of working with Gen5, using Gen5. Uh, you know, we lots of stuff we have included here, like uh, writing your own, uh, simulating your own unique ISA instructions, uh, modifying stuff in CPU, uh, definitely more stuff about creating your own sim objects and things like this. So uh, you can keep an eye out on the Gen5 mailing lists, the Slack, or the Gen5 events webpage for more information on that uh, will be, there's, there is currently a webpage in the Gen5 bootcamp, but uh, it's not open for people to sign up for it yet. Uh, last year we had 50, last year we had 50 attendees uh, from all across the US. Uh, and we hope to have 75 this year. Great for early stage PhD students uh, wanting to learn, 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 learn to use the tool. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, besides that, I think, we're pretty much at time. Um, thank you everyone for turning up to like one of the most annoying sessions at a conference, which is the early morning on day one on a Saturday. Uh, so <clears throat> thank you for making the effort. Uh, and yeah, uh, we, uh, we've got a small contribution in the loop point session, which is after lunch, we'll be showing you how to, uh, basically how loop points uh, work with Gen 5, which I already be kind of touched upon with the sim point demo. Uh, so please please feel free to come, come along and see that. Uh, Jason uh, or anybody else giving last remarks? Anything you want to say? Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks um, for coming. There's yeah. stickers in the back. Right? Oh, yeah. Gen 5 stickers. So if you want a sticker, stick it down in the back. Um, and we recorded this 
it'll be on YouTube. It's current. It's on YouTube right now. Um, Might edit down the parts that make no sense. Slides for sure. We'll post the slides up. That's easy to do. So on the their, uh, Gem Five website, there's an events page. List all the events we've done. The event for this will have an archive of everything we can yep. archive makes sense. Everything will be focused on my And the code spaces, the container that your code space is running in is going to poop out of existence in a few days, probably. Um, but you can still clone the repo. Yeah, you can still clone the repo, the code examples still there. Actually, a lot of the examples are based on stuff inside the code base anyway. I just kind of moved them to some place that made sense. So, yeah, go for it. And yeah, all the commands and the GPU stuff should work outside the containers since the containers didn't support it. So if you're trying to run these on your own, it should all, all be there. Yep. Uh, me and Jason are here until Tuesday if anyone wants to grab us and talk about Gen 5 stuff. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay.